everybody. Welcome to a, another episode of the Universe Within podcast. I hope this finds you all well. Uh, my guest for this episode is John McIntyre. Uh, I met John a number of months ago, maybe maybe even a year or so ago. Uh, we practice uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu together. And uh, I knew he uh, did work related to somatic experiencing or somatic therapy, <clears throat> uh, and I got to know him a little bit more and, and a bit more about the work uh, he does. So uh, I, I thought it would be a really good topic. Uh, somatic therapy, I think, is something that's that's very beneficial, uh, as we talked about um, in in my experience with working with plant medicine. I think somatic therapy is something that. Um, there's a really interesting symbiotic relationship. A lot of people who have worked with plants um, in the integration process uh, often find a lot of benefit in healing, uh, combining plant work with somatic therapy. So uh, I thought it'd be a, a really good idea to to have a guest on to come and speak about somatic therapy. Um, and I think John did a really good job. We uh, we talked about that, a bit about his background, what, what got him interested in that. Uh, it was interesting the beginning of the the podcast, we talked a lot about uh, kind of how this work can be done improperly and even how it can become a bit cultish and what that cultish mindset is. Uh, We talked about martial arts, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, somatic therapy, uh, really beginning to become embodied, to become present, to experience sensations in the body, different te- techniques of somatic therapy, um, and and how they relate to plant medicine as well. So it was a really fascinating conversation. Uh, I think you all will get a lot out of this. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. As always, if you are able to support this podcast, that's a, a really big help to me. Patreon is a really good way. It's a website. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for and those tiers give you different things back, things like um, early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Um, I, I really like that platform because it very much uh, works on this idea of reciprocity. So if you feel like you're gaining from uh, gaining something from this podcast, uh, that's a really good way to give back, and, and that really helps me to continue to um, to make and to, to bring these shows out to, to you all. Uh, to all of the patrons, to all the people who are supporting that way, as always, thank you very much very much for your support. Um, and if you're able to do that, thank you in advance. Um, there's also the ability to donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, uh, helping with the algorithms is always a, a really big help. It helps to get the show out to bigger audience. So if you're viewing this on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the videos, leaving any questions or comments in the comment section, that really helps. <clears throat> Uh, with Spotify now, uh, you can also uh, subscribe and, and um, uh, rate the show as well. Uh, and if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, uh, leaving a starred rating and a short review is also a really big help. So uh, I think that's it. So without further ado, here is my conversation with John. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so we do jujitsu together. That's how that's how I met you originally. Uh, you practice with Chase, mm-hmm. who's also been on the podcast. Uh, yeah, he's a he's a good guy. Um, so maybe just to start uh, telling the audience a bit about your story. What? Uh, who are you? Where you're from? What you mm-hmm. do? Mm-hmm. What brought you to Sacred Valley? What made mm-hmm. you uh, do the work you're doing? Well, um, where to begin? My name is John. John uh, John Wood. For this. John McIntyre, there's some other things, but originally from Sydney, Australia, I grew up there and then, um, it depends how far back you want to go, but during COVID, <clears throat> I've been in Thailand for about, overseas, living overseas for about 10 years, from 20, say 21 till 
COVID started, came back to Australia because uh, Riders COVID was kicking off. I had this big thing blow up with some uh, people I'd worked with, some life coaches. An interesting story, which we, we can go into if you want, but ended up cutting them off. Uh, Let's go into the life coach story. <laughs> <That sounds like laughs> you a, want to go straight Sounds into like it. a good one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Which is really, to me, is a bit of like the genesis of, of some of the other stuff we might talk about today. But I'm living in Thailand. I've been in there. I was there for two and a half, three years, say 2011, 2012. And then went away. I went traveling around the world for a while. I came back in 2020, 2020, 2016. Uh, met a girl, fell in love, had a good relationship. I was living in Thailand. And uh, I think it was 20, I don't know the exact year, but maybe 2019 ish uh, met a couple a married couple who through a business like a business networking thing I was part of called clients on demand where you learn how to build a high ticket coaching business life coaching business and uh, so we connected they were in I was in Chiang Mai at the time and they were there so we went out to dinner and it was just one of those things hey like we're in the same group do you want to go let's go get some vegan food and just hang out and so I went to hang out with them just on my own the first time and, and I had a great time. I thought they were um, into very similar things. It was psychedelics and a lot of the books that we'd read about, you know, being present and, um, you know, learning how to feel and surrender, all those kinds of things. Very, you know, it felt like we were, you know, we could be really good friends. I remember even telling my girlfriend at the time, I feel like this couple is like you and me, like, you know, 20 years from now or something. And uh, so that was the first time I met them. And then a few months, I think a couple months later, I took my girlfriend to meet them just for another lunch and we, you know, hung out and chatted and it was a very friendly kind of thing for a while. And uh, I think my girlfriend, they, they work as life coaches. So they do like sort of a mixture of, you know, if you hire them for, you know, life coaching, they'll give you some mushrooms or some ayahuasca and do like a home. They're not like properly in Peru, compared to what it is in Peru, not properly trained. I think they've just drank a lot of, say, ayahuasca and different things. So they do these life coaching things. So my girlfriend and I, you know, eventually were having some trouble. I can't even really remember what it was about. But um, she hired them to work with them and she got better. Or, you know, whatever was going on improved. And then my sister had some stuff come up a couple months after that. And um, I didn't know who, who to really send her to or how to help. So I told her to talk to these people and see what they'd say. And... Um, so she did that and I helped her as well. So I don't usually share this part of the story, so it's interesting. Um, and then uh, what was interesting is that we kept hanging out with them. We'd hang out every Sunday. We'd go out to different restaurants in Chiang Mai. It was really very much like it felt like we're friends, you know. And uh, I think I trusted them and respected them. But what was interesting is that throughout the time, we would chat via WhatsApp, send voice messages back and forth. And I had a funny feeling. Couldn't tell you what it was or why it was there. I probably can now in retrospect, but at the time, it just something, you know when you meet someone and, and, and it's a bit like, uh, like something's just not, I can't put words to it. I can't put my finger on exactly what it is, but something's off. And I remember that feeling that months, maybe in the middle of, I think it was middle of 2019. Remember throughout the time I was getting to know them. And then uh, it was about about October, I think. I was helping them. We were doing like a coaching swap. They would help me with uh, sort of their life coaching stuff and I would help them with marketing because I've worked in marketing for a long time. So we'd be writing Facebook ads together or whatever. And one day uh, the wife, she sent me a Facebook ad that she'd been working on. And uh, the, the, the lead sort of headline or title of it was Get Unstuck In On Purpose. And I read that, I'm like, fuck, that's what I want. That's, that's what I, you know, at the time, I, just some context, at the time I had an online business, still do, but, you know, I was making money, I was living overseas, I had a pretty great life. And there was, you know, I did enjoy it in a lot of ways, but there was, it's that thing I think a lot of people have, is something's missing, something's not right, like I'm not fulfilled, I'm not happy uh, on a deep, profound kind of way. And so I read this ad uh, that she'd written, and um, I was like, I, I want that. Like, can you do this with me? Like that, you've got me, you know? So um, I signed up. I paid them, I think, 3,000 US dollars at the time. And uh, 
the husband, he said, uh, so we'll do three things. We'll do plant work, energy work, and thought work, I think is what he called it. And so what happened after that was we did a couple coaching calls, which were probably what you would expect from like a life coaching sort of thing. Energy work was, I think, some distance healing kind of stuff when you meet like an energy work and they do some clearing past life contracts and kinds of weird stuff. But <laughs> the the... I guess the main event was the uh, ceremony, the plant work. I went around to their place one day and I'd, uh, they told me to figure out my intention for what I wanted to do and what I wanted to get out of it. We're going to do a ceremony together. And so we're sitting on their front deck in, the, in Chiang Mai, um, a really nice place, and we take these mushroom chocolates. Well, first of this, I, I told them that the intention was, I'd written a whole page of stuff, but what I said it boiled down to was purpose, passion, and profit. I wanted to find something that I believed in, really deeply, passionately believed in. And then I wanted passion, right? So to me, purpose is the something I believe in. Passion is something I enjoy doing. So it's not just something I think the world needs, it's something I'd love to do. I'd love to be all about it, you know? And then profit was really just uh, some way to make money with it, you know? Like not something where it's, yeah, some way to build, a business, build it into a business and help people with it. So purpose, passion, and profit. And then we took the, uh, told them all of that, and then they gave me like a mushroom chocolate. We all had one, so it was me and then the, the married couple. And we, I think what happened, not a lot happened at first, it took a little while to kick in as always. But at some point, uh, I'm just gonna call them by name because it's easier, but Misha, I've written an whole article about this if people want more details, but Misha started talking and, um, Like an alien language, it reminded me of like one of the aliens in Star Wars, where it's like, it's bay, you yeah, like a really weird guttural thing, and um, gradually it became clear. It's almost like he was apparently on the phone or like talking to some, I don't know, multi-dimensional beings in some other place, some other planet. And this is by this point the mushrooms are starting to kick in. I'm like, okay, let's. I've done a little bit of plant medicine already. I'll go. I'll go with it and see where this goes. Um, eventually, I think one of them gets worried. They're like, we're gonna go inside. It's we don't want the neighbors to hear this. This this is pretty weird and out there. So we go in the living room. I lie down. I have a mattress in there, so I lie down on the mattress. And Mish is on the one side. Cecile, his wife, is on the other, and he continues this chatting. It really is like he's on the phone, but instead of a phone, he's plugged into something, apparently. It didn't seem like he was, if he made all of that up, it would be pretty, um, pretty impressive. So I think whatever he was doing, he, he believes there was something to it. So I'm lying there and then he's doing like, I don't know what you call it, Reiki or not, whatever, but he's scanning through the body with his hands. He's not touching me, but he's sort of moving throughout the whole body. I guess he was apparently, what, he, what they were telling me, he was looking for blockages, looking for things that were you know, in my life that was stopping me from, say, having a purpose, passion, and profit. So he's doing this, and he's scanning, and he's changing things, and I guess it's a bit like Reiki, where, yeah, like, or pranic healing, what some people do here, where they're sort of changing how the energy works, how it flows, fixing the chakras, whatever. And uh, at some point, he's, he's, this goes on for a while, and I'm just chilling. He's still on the phone with these aliens. And uh, it starts to sound like he's wrapping it up, you know, when you're on the phone with someone, and they you know, the, the cadence or the style of the conversation starts to feel like, okay, they're, they're wrapping it up now. And so this is, that's what it sounded like was happening as he was doing it. And then at some point he's like, oh, he found something. And, um, and then he's, you know, gets really intense on, you know, with this alien talk for a while, he's chattering away. And then um, he eventually comes out and says to me and his wife, Cecile, he says, so apparently these beings are saying, that John killed 20 million people in his past life. Eight, two million of them were innocent. So 18 million deserved it. So I killed 18 million innocent people, apparently, in a past life. And because of that, because of how karmic law works or some shit like that, I now have 18 million locks <coughs> on my power, on my ability to, on my power, ability to create or something like that. And, uh, and I'm too dangerous to unlock them. So Misha at this point had been sort of making all these robot sounds as he's working on it. Like, so it all felt very legit. It might sound ridiculous now, but 
Like, he's like, it was crazy. And then uh, when they told him, okay, he's too dangerous to let out, he starts shutting them all down again, locking, locking me up, I guess, or trying to make me think that. And um, this happened over, you know, an hour or two or something. Like, it was quite long-winded. And uh, it happened conveniently. It was on another planet. So it's not an, on Earth. This was some past life on a different planet. So we can't verify if, if it ever actually happened. Because I went looking on I was like, well, how many people did Hitler kill or Pol Pot or any of these genocidal dudes in, on Earth? And, um, and at some point, so this went on for ages, and then at some point we went outside. There was other stuff they said, uh, but at some point we went outside. I remember I was, I used to, I like to ask a lot of questions, especially in a situation like that. I'm trying to figure out what the hell is this? So I'm asking them questions about like, how do you know this is true or how does this actually work and, and I guess they didn't appreciate that so then the wife Cecile she would call me she called me told me I was arrogant um, you know this is a, and then after that so we chatted for a while outside and, and I don't know if I took it as 100% fact or truth but I guess the effect of it and this was cultivator I suppose over the time relating to them before that and afterwards was it created doubt you know and even afterwards when I'd, I'd see them because we still kept a bit of the coaching thing going and there was this you know and I would tell them about a book I'm reading or an idea I had they, they, it would be this whole thing you're too in your mind you think too much and uh, you know some arrogant they told my girlfriend at the time too like, he's dark he can't be trusted he's dangerous or in his past life, at least he was. So it creates this doubt. It's undermining. And um, yeah, I didn't believe it 100% as fact. But yeah, what it created was that sense of, well, what if they are right? What if it is true? What if they're the only people who know how to fix me? And um, so that went on until we had that ceremony in October 2019. And uh, by 20, January 2020, I think, is when... It, and this is where it gets into some of the other stuff. I mentioned Ray Chart to you and, and working with the nervous system, and you've heard a little bit about that. But I took a course in that from someone else, learning how to get into the body, learning how to feel the emotions, understanding how the fight-or-flight response works. So this was three months after that ceremony. Because I'd already talked to them. I'd said, I think, straight away afterwards, I'd been like... Look, this isn't making sense. Like, if you said this to someone who was suicidal, who was depressed, they could walk away and kill themselves. Like, it, it, you have no idea how irresponsible, how dangerous this is, what you've just told me. And because um, my dad had brought that, I told my dad and my sister and my cousin at the time. And so dad had made that point that, yeah, you, if you told someone who was a bit more fragile emotionally or mentally that they were worse than Hitler by innocent people killed and they took that on they might walk out and kill themselves like it's a realistic possibility and so I brought that up with them and of course no 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 you're just thinking about this too much you're overthinking it you're in your head you know lots of mind games funnily enough and uh, so anyway January comes around I'd, I'd be like all right whatever <laughs> that's right I remember thinking it's my problem Right, because it'd be like, oh well, I'm angry. I'm a bit. This doesn't feel right to me. I'm uncomfortable. But hey, maybe it's it's just my issue. I'm just projecting. I'm just a bit triggered, you know. And then in January, I started uh, learning about the nervous system and the fight or flight response and how we respond to threats and danger and what the true, say, significance of anger is. Um, and once I started getting into that, very quickly, I think it was in with a few days or in the first week or two of that, I realized. I was feeling two things, or two, two really obvious emotions came. One of them was uh, sadness, because I realized that my girlfriend at the time, she'd been working, she'd done two sort of coaching sort of arrangements with them, so she was very influenced, persuaded by them. So by that point, by the time I started to realize what they'd really done and how abusive and manipulative it was, I also realized that it was too, my girlfriend had been too hooked in, you know, like um, they'd gotten so in her head 
so that when I brought it up with her, these people are not who, the, who, they, who we think they are. They're dangerous. She just thought I had trust issues. Oh, it's just, you, yeah, you're thinking too much. All the stuff that they'd already told her and told both of us, that John is, he has trust issues, anger issues, all those different things. So one of those emotions was sadness as I realized that these people are fucked and my girlfriend can't see it. And I'm, you know, we'd been dating for, I think, four years by that point. I don't, you know... I think in the year before that, I'd started to think about kids and marriage. It was getting serious. Um, very much in love, I thought, at the time. But they, yeah, wiggled, wriggled their way into her brain, into her psyche so much that there was, she, she couldn't come back for it, from it. And I knew that at the time somehow. Um, and so on top of that, so there was the sadness. And there's like, is that this realization developed both about her and just the whole situation. The other... Aside, the other emotion was rage as I finally started to put the dots together at what had really happened and what was still happening and what they were doing and how they'd gotten into my head. And so part of it was, um, I remember I spoke to her. I didn't tell many people about what had happened with them at the time because the whole genocide, past life, all that, just I'm, like people are going to think I'm crazy. I can't talk about this stuff, which is another red flag. And so <clears throat> I uh, didn't tell my friends, didn't only tell, like I said, dad, my sister, and my cousin. And then um, I told my, decided I can't figure this shit out. Like this is, um, I need some perspective. So I told a friend, a really good friend of mine, and he said, have you, um... <laughs> that's right, sort of a lot of disjoints and pieces here. I remember around that time in January, I went to toys. I started to, started to see like, this really doesn't make sense. I, I got to figure this out. I tried to talk to them again. Um, Cecile it was, and we'd send some voice messages back and forth. And I'm like this, how could you, like I said, how could you tell someone this if some people would lose their shit, maybe even kill themselves, do really crazy things. If you told them this, how can you, you know, I just can't understand why you would tell me this stuff. And she just kept putting it back on me. You're projecting, you know, like we're not going to talk about what we said to you, but if you want help working out your thoughts, we'll help. And uh, so I told a friend this at the time and he uh, he listened and, and eventually just said, have you ever heard of, do you know what gaslighting is? And I'd heard the term, and, and but I'd never put much attention onto it. And uh, after that phone call, I went back to the, back to the house and uh, looked it up on like spiritual gaslighting specifically, but gaslighting in general as well. As soon as I read that first article, it's like the penny, that was when it really started dropping in of the game that these people were playing. Because for so long, you know what gaslighting is, right? So for so long, it would have been like that subtle, anytime I had any question, any problem with anything that they said or anything that they did, they always put it back on me. I'm the one who's got some issue. I'm the one who's got a, a trust issue, an anger issue. I think too much, I'm this, I'm that. And um, because I didn't have that concept of gaslighting, I didn't understand that, I missed it. I couldn't see what, that was, what was really going on. But once, once I got some awareness, some understanding of what that manipulative game is of gaslighting, it was like, oh, they've been doing this shit the whole fucking time I've been hanging out with them. I missed it. And uh, I mean... Anyway, that's the that's really the story. It set off a whole bunch of stuff in terms of you know growth and things to learn uh, about cults and manipulation and um, but um, yeah, and then that was why so I was in Thailand and around that time I'm like my girlfriend I I gotta let it. We didn't break up right then, but I'm like she's not getting it. I tried talking to her, she didn't get it, and so. I remember feeling this really strong urge to go home. I was in Thailand and I was like, I have to go home. I have to go to my family. I, I really missed my family. So, um, so I went home, cut those, got the coaches off. And I think a few months later I broke up with, um, the girl, um, cause she just, she just couldn't, you know, like I said, too, very much too plugged into what these two people were doing to influence. So there was no coming back. Um, so yeah, I can keep going if you want with the story, or I don't know if you want to stop and yeah, keep keep going. <laughs> um, so I went back. So after all that happened, I remember I went back to Australia. It was February twenty twenty. Uh, COVID had just kicked off. 
I got back to Australia, I think a week or two before the lockdown started. So it was perfect timing. I got back, the borders shut in Australia, no one could go in or out. Uh, I went to mum's place. Uh, she lives on a farm, which is great. So it was just, I mean, after this whole thing happened with these coaches, like it, it, it I don't know how it sounds to, to, to someone listening, but it was a lot to work through. Um, to have your mind fucked with in that way. Um, like I said, I never really believed 100% what they said, but there was so much subtle undermining of who I am, what I am, that I'm bad, blah, blah, blah. And it took a while to start to puzzle, you know, pull that out or start to figure out what had really happened um, and undo it. But uh, I went to mum's place and was, and that's when I started learning more about the nervous system and the fight or flight response and went deeper into um, that stuff which was a huge part of what helped me process, I think, a lot of what happened here. It still wasn't quick. Um, but then, uh, and then the, you know, I broke up, I think it was about May 2020. That was rough as well. Uh, I'd never been through it. I never dated a girl for that. This was four years. So not, not super long, but not short either. And I never had a relationship like that. So when that ended, I was shattered. It was okay. Like it was, it was beautiful in many ways to feel so much uh, but again there was that as well so the stress of uh, what had happened with these coaches and then the, the breakup too moving country was another thing and then COVID on top of all that so it was with mums uh, doing all this work and then I uh, went to dad's as well <clears throat> for a while so it was in this place of where like if people wonder why I was living with family uh, part of it was because um, I'd been outside of Australia so long so I didn't have a home in Australia really well I had parents and some family but that was it and I, at that point I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in Australia which I'm glad I didn't get my own place because it would have been a lot harder to come here but um, eventually I yeah, spent some time with mom and then went and spent some time with dad and what was really interesting is as I kept working through the stuff that had happened with these with these coaches I remember reading I read a book called <clears throat> a few book, great books called um, one was called Combating Cult Mind Control by a dude named Stephen Hassan, I think. He's like a cult, I don't know what the proper term is, but like a cult rescue specialist. So if someone gets caught up in the Moonies or Scientology or some cult, uh, the parents of the person or the friends might call Steve and say, look, we've got a friend or we've got a son or we've got a daughter and they've become caught up in this cult, can you help? And he'll help them stage an invention and intervention and hopefully get the person out. <clears throat> so we wrote a book about cults and about the psychology and about how they work. And uh, another book, great book was um, The Guru Papers, which is all about how gurus in all, a lot of it was about spiritual gurus, like, you know, Indian yogis and shit like that. It would apply, very much apply, I'm sure, to a lot of the sketchier uh, maestros, say in Peru, for example. A lot of the games that they play with power and I read these two books, and once I read that, I think that's why I did a course on manipulation as well, that just went through all the different ways that people can manipulate. So like gaslighting being one of them, guilt tripping. I've done so much for you, how can you say that? I've, I've taken care of you. I think parents can do this a lot. Oh, I've spent so much time and money taking care of you, how can you be upset with me? How can you criticize? So guilt tripping, minimization is, um, it's not that big of a deal. It's a bit like gaslighting. It's not that big of a deal. What are you so upset about? Um, there's lots of different things that people do. And so, so I was really doing, trying to learn about all of them. So I'm like, I don't want this to happen again. I want to figure out what it is, why it happened and all of that. And uh, once I read, you know, learned about some of this stuff, it's like, this is like a step-by-step -step playbook that these people used. Like I can see like all the different things that they said you're arrogant and you have trust issues and you think too much, this talking to me. It was like, oh, this is standard. Like the way cults work, right, is a big part of how they um, suck people in is they sort of step one is invalidate who the person is right now, like break them down. Before you can build them back up in the image of the cult, you have to break down who they are. And um, that's really, you know, telling someone they're arrogant, telling someone they think too much. The whole... The underlying message is whoever you are is not enough. Something's wrong with you. Something's broken. Uh, we have the answer. And first, we're going to make you, we're going to get you to believe and accept that you're a piece of shit. So then you let go of who you think you are or who you, your authentic part of you. And then we're going to give you a new operating system of who to be, how to behave, what to believe, what to say. 
And um, seeing that, like, play, it's a very simple, in a way, playbook, like a break you down, and then once you're all empty and, and open, and you're not super, you know, you know you're know, you ashamed of who you are or your, your authentic self, it's much easier for them to slide in that whatever they want you to be. And so reading and learning about that was like, that was when the light bulb was really going off and seeing, okay, this is what these people did. What do you think is the... <clears throat> I guess like the the definition or or, or defining characteristics of a cult, because it's something I find very fascinating. And and, and I think there's a lot of cultish mindset behavior out there, but it's not necessarily named. It it often only gets named when it like when it goes to the extreme and something breaks down and then there's like a shock Mm -hmm. or a trauma. And then people realize like, oh, shit, I was in a cult, you know people begin to die or they lose all their money mm-hmm. uh, or the authorities have to come in. But up until that point, there there's an accepting. And I mean, I think it's really common. I mean, you see it in politics. So there's a lot of cultish behavior. You, you see it in a lot of religion. You see it in a lot of society. I mean, you know, probably a lot of people are going to disagree me, w- with me with this, but even COVID w- was very cultish. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, you can look at uh, some of the ways, like you said, I mean, there's often kind of like these step-by-step processes that that people will define as to what is is a cultish behavior or power, authority. And when you look at that, you know, just using COVID as an example, like uh, making people afraid, making them uh, fearful, having a, an authority who has all mm-hmm. the answers, uh, censoring anyone who goes against those views, uh, isolating people, mm-hmm. uh, pitting people against each other, um, you know, having this, this thing where if you do this one thing or you take this one thing, then all of the problems will go away. But you also can't speak about any of the other issues with it. You know, like these are all like very definitional yeah. qualities of, of what a cult is. But... I guess my question is a little long-winded, but like I see cults in a lot of things, but but often people don't name it that. Mm -hmm. And again, it's often until something like really bad happens. So what do you think are those defining characteristics or how would you define a cult? Because again, I think a lot of people, like it's easy to see a cult in retrospect. Mm -hmm. It's very easy. Like you're like, how did people fall for that? Mm -hmm. Um, But in the moment... You know, I think a lot of people have cultish mindsets, cultish behavior. I'd say the majority of people, most people do. I mean, even kind of in the spiritual path, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. It's like breaking free of those those thought patterns. Mm-hmm. So well, I guess how would you define or these books or, and then your, your understanding of them? Like what separates that mindset, that, that mindset of, of what a cult is? I guess, like, if I think about the word cult, like, that, to me, implies, like, a almost like an organization. Like, I would say that these people in Thailand, Cecile and Michelle, they're still up and running, too. Um, it's almost like they're, it's cultish, but I don't know if I'd really call them a cult. Um, I guess, to me, as far as the, like, I, when I think about cult, I think about Scientology, a lot of religion, a lot of spiritual stuff. Uh, but as far as the mindset goes, it's just power. Like it's the age old people feel, I imagine a lot of it's people feel deep down a lack of power. And so then they engage in, with a lot of them without being aware of any behaviors to get more power. Now, when I look at it like that, then it's like, because to maybe some context, when I, I started to wonder with these coaches, I'm like, how did I how did I fall for this? Like once I started to see what had really happened, it was like, this is pretty obvious. Like I'm a pretty logical, you know, I grew up going to church, but when I came out, I read all the books about, you know, logical fallacies and evolution and science. And I was pretty proud of being, you know, yeah, logical and reasonable. I'm like, how did I get caught up in this? And, um, and that by tracking it, and spending time with family, I eventually realized I could see it in my dad. Not 
I mean, these people in Thailand, I would say they're like outrightly, I wouldn't be surprised if they're even aware, they, they're actually aware of what they're doing, they do it anyway. But I started to see similar things, not the same, but the same kind of mechanism or dynamic with my dad, not so much with my mom, minor things, but and I'm sure this is very typical of most families. The, the specific like way it plays out will probably be different, but uh, I could see the same basic dynamic with my dad where if he said something or did something that I wasn't happy with and I pointed it out to him, it would be the same games of, I've done so much for you. What's the big deal? Why are you making such a, you saw it tight. You know, it was these automatic, I don't think he's doing it consciously. He's just, just like a learned behavior for him. Probably because the same thing happened with his mom or his dad or both or someone else in his life early on. And from what I understand about the family history, that's more or less what had happened. So then he was made to feel like a piece of shit. Shame, call it whatever, fear. And then uh, if I point out something that he didn't do very good at, a mistake maybe, or something that I perceive as a mistake, he, <clears throat> he can't, cannot accept or take responsibility for it because that would remind him or bring, start to stir up um, some of that shame, some of that guilt or whatever that, that really ugh, uncomfortable feeling is. And instead of feeling that, probably because he just doesn't even know it's there or even have the tools to do it, his automatic instinctual response is to then push it onto me. Oh, John, you're uptight, you're this, you're that. And I don't even think it's about me, it's about him believing that because as long as he believes that, he doesn't have to face and feel the stuff from his childhood. So that to me, I think is the root of all of it. If people didn't have that in the first place, like these with these coaches, the reason I think their shit worked on me is because I had unresolved stuff from my childhood. In that specific, I tend to think it was mainly with my dad. I love, he's a great guy in many ways, but this specifically was not great. Um, so that to me, if I think about cults, it's just that, that same like unresolved childhood stuff, uh, the same stuff we're all working with with psychedelics. Writ, writ, if you take COVID, it's the same thing writ large. It's like the same unresolved childhood, child parent dynamics, but blown up across an entire society. Um, so I don't know if that really answers the question, but that to me, I think is the root of it. And if people can, to me, I guess the, the, the solution is for people to go and to do the work, to work through their stuff. And then all the ways that people hook into them and control them start to dissolve. Um, but it's not quick or easy. Do you think a lot of that, that power dynamic is, is unconscious? And, or do you think it's, there's a deliberate manipulative aspect to it? I don't know, man. I've wondered so many times, like with these, um, like with a couple in Thailand, I'm like, do they... Like every, I think pretty much every single person I told that story to, some variation of it, every single person is like, that's fucked. Like, I cannot believe they, they did that. Um, I never met anyone, I've told quite a few people, who's like, oh wow, like, you know, no, John, you'd be right, you're being a bit fussy about this, you're overreacting, overreacting here. Um, and so, <laughs> clearly it's like, to the average person, that kind of behavior, especially to people who are involved in the psychedelic plant medicine world and have been for a while, they tend to understand that, okay, I need to be careful what I say to people when they're under the influence because they're open and it can go in a lot deeper. So I need to be very, as a practitioner, I need to be very careful what messages I'm putting out to people in the space, especially when we're in there. And I imagine most people are going to be, if they've done their work, they're going to be decently aware of that, if not perfect, at least aware of it. Whereas these coaches, it's like they acted as though they were completely oblivious. I'm like, you, you either have to be so stupid that you did this and don't realize how stupid it is, or absolutely stone cold narcissists who had just know exactly what you're doing and you're doing it anyway. I don't, I remember saying that to them. I'm like, it's one or the other. You're either absolute idiots or total narcissists. narcissists. I can't find any other explanation for this. There's no rational reason why you can do this to someone. And I remember saying that to them and they would just sort of sidestep it. Um, and I still don't really know the answer. I don't know if they were oblivious and that's why they did it or if they knew what they were doing. Um, after more um, you know, experience in the medicine world, 
I, I tend to think that they're plugged into something. We call it a spirit or some kind of energy or some something. They're plugged into something and maybe they think in their head, this is all clear. This is really clear, beautiful, pure energy and they're being manipulated as much as they're manipulating other people. I don't know, man. I, you know, I don't think my dad is aware of it. You, you talk about politicians. I don't know, man. Even someone who is aware of it and still does it, in some ways, like they're not really fully aware. Because I feel like if they were fully aware of exactly what they were doing and the cost of it, not just to others but to themselves, they wouldn't do it. So, what I have heard, though, I remember going into like a. There's a lot of people who talk about narcissism now. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube. And so I'd hear people talk about like, <clears throat> I don't have any way to prove this either way, but some people you get like a narcissist who doesn't really know. They don't know what they're doing. Um, then you get other ones that know exactly what they're doing and they do it anyway. And there's a spectrum. And some people are sort of at the unaware end. Some people are at the aware end. But I don't know, man. Like it's it's... That's another lesson that came out of it. I think sometimes we assume if we try to do the right thing and we try not to manipulate people, we often assume that other people are going to behave just like us. They're going to do the right thing too. And um, there's another lesson from this whole experience was that I think Jordan Peterson or Jocko talk about this, this whole concept, but the idea that we make ourselves vulnerable in that when we if we're not in touch with our own dark side, knowing what we would do if we were pissed off or like our capacity for say darkness, manipulation, we'll underestimate the potential for darkness in other people. This is a bit of a tangent, I suppose, but then make ourselves vulnerable to, to, to these kinds of people because we won't be able to preempt or understand or expect what they're actually gonna do unless we've come to terms with it inside, ourself, inside ourselves. Um, I think that's a... Super valid point. <clears throat> Dude, it was funny, man. Like after when I was processing this, you know, for the year or two after this, and I was doing um, this nervous system work. One of the exercises was that I got taught was um, call it annihilation work, right? Where you would, if I'm furious with someone, and I I need to process or feel some of that emotion, but I'm not going to go and I I don't want to go and kill them, right? That would be bad for everyone uh, one way to work with it <clears throat> is to it's a specific way, whole thing of way of doing it but to go into the imagination and to imagine what I would do with this person no holds barred and uh, so I started playing with this technique and uh, I'd say it's a somewhat of an advanced technique I wouldn't recommend it to someone if they've never or if there's a lot there and they're not get some grounding and stuff in first but at some point, maybe it's a good idea. But for me, I, it's like the rage, man, like the desire to fucking destroy these people. I, I, like it blew me away. I'd never felt, up until that point, this whole thing with these people, I remember thinking, my girlfriend, uh, the one I, you know, the girlfriend from that whole time was, um, she go, you ever get angry? I'm like, no, I'm just not an angry person. Yeah, sometimes when I'm driving or something, but I don't really get angry. And uh, after this whole debacle with these people, I finally, I got in touch with the anger, with the rage. And uh, when I started doing that imagination exercise, the annihilation work, I could not believe like the things I wanted to do with these people. And it felt good to actually go into that, to feel that, to imagine that. Like it, it, it was confronting in some ways to kind of go, like it goes back to that darkness thing to see, oh wow, like if I wanted to, if I didn't have anything to lose, and I wanted to hurt these people, like I, I could do it. Like I, and I would do it if, if there was no consequence, nothing to lose, right? And to see that in myself was, um, yeah, confronting. Um, also very freeing as well to kind of go like it's protective to start to get in touch with that side in a safe, healthy, like contained way, not out of control. You know, I'm not going to go and actually kill them or anything or do anything to them, but um, to actually feel that. And to express it and acknowledge it and to and to understand that's why the nervous system stuff was so helpful because it's like we think about the fight fight or flight the fight response that energy of aggression of attacking of rage is a it's a valid you know it's hardwired into the nervous system and so when someone crosses a line with us 
I think for so long I felt guilty and ashamed about my anger. But after this, it was like, oh, this is protective. This is like, I am meant to be feeling this right now. It's beautiful. And, um, yeah. What do you think is that balance? Because that, that, that's something I always find very fascinating. Like, you you know, you're speaking about these people and this idea of, like, having anger and and. and like how that's you know actually a natural response then you're also talking about your father and and how you could see within him there was like these generational things like he was maybe acting a certain way because he took on something Mm -hmm. um you know i think another common example that, that that maybe would resonate with people because it's quite an extreme example is something like pedophilia the vast majority of pedophiles do what they do because they've also had that done to them. Mm. And so I think on the one hand, there's this sense of like, maybe uh, like with your father, like, like a compassion, like obviously that's an extreme, probably not with your father, but, but you know, just we all have patterns that, that we take on that, that are often inherited through, through birth. I mean, if you want to look at it through past lives, but even just through social conditioning, the words that, that, that our parents say, the, the, the habits that we're, we're raised with. So I think like you were saying, you know, on the one hand, there can be a compassion that arises. And then on the other hand, like if you look at pedophilia, I don't think many people would argue that the only response is to be compassionate to that person. Mm. You know, and I think that's where that 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 idea of like anger, or, which, which often feeds this sense of like justice, like no, these people need to be held accountable. You know, whether that's through violence or through through putting someone in jail or locking them up or you know wh- whatever the punishment is. I, I know it's kind of a big question, but where do you think where do you think that balance lies? Because I think that's something many people struggle with. Uh, you know, especially with, with plant medicine work, because often when people are working with plants, like something may come up with them. Uh, and then it's, what do I do with that? Mm-hmm. Like, do I take out that rage in that person or do I forgive them? And I think a lot of people are confused with that. You know, some people take like a, maybe a more Christian view, like, well, just turn the other cheek or have compassion towards them. Mm-hmm. And then you have the other end of the spectrum, which is like, which is also very religious, which is an eye for an eye, a tooth mm-hmm. for a tooth. Mm-hmm. Uh, I stone you to death, mm-hmm. and I'm justified in doing that. The Bible says I can do that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I know for me, like what I did, what I continue to do, my approach to this stuff now is like, when I realized what had happened with these coaches, I was like, all right, that's it, zero tolerance. Anyone does this shit, they're out. It, like, I'll chat to them explain things to them see if they're on board with it if they're not we're done um, so with the coaches like in Thailand once I put it together and, and I tried talking to them again cut them off blocked them everywhere uh, once I was back in Australia I did try and get a refund from them um, we went back and forth a few times via email and that just was the same same shit so I was like okay well, that's it then and what I actually did with the coaches I wrote an article because at some point I I couldn't let it go, man. I tried, you know, I'd meditate. I'd do all the shit, journal about it, all the stuff to let it go. And it, and it was great, but I couldn't, I couldn't let it, like, I, I don't know, it just wasn't, my system wasn't able to just forget about it or let it go. And I felt like on that anger thing, I had to do something. So I decided to, I'm not gonna go and attack them and beat them up or whatever. Um, what I can do though is as a writer and a marketer, I can write an article about what happened. And I can make a rank in Google for their names and their business name. And um, I can be detailed and blah, blah, blah. So I wrote a whole article. That was part of my way of channeling the, I guess, the desire for revenge or attack, like to really remove the energy. Some people call, I think revenge has a bad name, but there's an impulse to respond in some way. And I felt like I needed to do something. So I did the article and, um, once I did that, you know, there's other stuff I could do. I wouldn't say like, it's, it's like, I still don't like them. I'm not going to spend any time with them. If I saw them around, I don't know how I'd respond. But, um, but once I published that article and sent it around to a few people, I, it, it just didn't stick with me the way that it had. It's like, I could let it go, you know? Um, so that's what happened with them, with my, with my dad. We're not talking at the moment. We had a, 
so this like what was when I was as I was starting to notice these patterns while living with him I started to point them out and I think people who've you know they've been a habit or when we change when anyone changes it throws off the whole dynamic you're know, like with another person there's a system there in place and so my understanding is my dad was you know used to a certain dynamic and when I stopped playing that when I start, started being unwilling to play that same the same games or put up with it he I was not happy <laughs> and uh, we had a very big fight and uh, he said some things which were pretty didn't get physical but like uh, verbally it was about as violent as it could get I'll just say that and I was still at the house with him at the time and my way of responding because at the time my way of sort of talking about it was like, okay um, there's something here that's not working for me let's talk I'll go talk to dad hey I'd read, you know, nonviolent communications and trying to figure out how do we communicate. So like, when you do this, I feel this. In the future, can you do that instead? Can you do something different? So I tried. I'm not perfect at it. But I did what I could at the time to try and make a point. <laughs> like, you do what you want, but at least with me, don't talk to me like this, don't treat me like this, and we'll be good. <clears throat> but... Um, you know, he was okay with it at first, but at some point it's like he just got, um, I don't know, I guess it just reached ahead. And he's like, he, you know, we both, you know, I didn't want to back, neither of us wanted to back down. He didn't want to back down from his different behaviors. I didn't want to back down from my new, my new, I guess, uh, idea of how I wanted to relate to him and vice versa. And so, yeah, so he said some things and um, he blew up and we had this big fight. And um, after that happened, I was still in the house at the time. And the feeling, and this comes from the nervous system stuff, I put my finger on it, was I was like, I don't, I don't feel safe in this house. Like if I know that I cannot talk to him and I can't be truthful with him about what I'm feeling, and this, was a, this, this has been a pattern throughout my whole life with him. It'd be interesting if he ever listens to this. Um, but... He would be great, 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 great. And then, but if I said the wrong thing, he'd explode. Not never physically, but verbally. It's like emotional, mental barbs and stuff. And, um, and so once I was like, okay, this pattern, I've tried as an adult to resolve it with him. I've tried to talk about it. I've done the best I can at this point in time. Certainly not perfect. Um, and it's still not, he's still, that whatever that is, whatever's driving that is not ready to shift. And so I'm like, okay, well, I don't feel safe then. Because if I can't be honest with him, if I can't just be who I am, which means being honest about what I'm feeling, what I need, all that sort of stuff, without fear of him going to explode again like that and get verbally violent and manipulative, I can't be around it. It's like, a, it was more just like a, like I can see, for example, with him and people who do this, like there is room for compassion if going, they're not, like I don't think he's a bad person, for example. He's just acting out these patterns. And right now he's not ready to let those patterns go because they're protecting something, is my understanding. So it's preventing him from feeling something that he really doesn't want to feel. Which, for that to be that strong, whatever is uncomfortable, whatever's buried in there, to me, must be really intense. But I can't feel it for him. It's, it's, it's really, oh, he's the only one who can do it. And if he's not willing to do that right now and he's going to keep behaving like this, I feel like my responsibility... To, to, my, to everyone, to him, but specifically to him and me, is to break, break contact. Because if I put up with it and, val and basically send in the message that it's okay to behave like this, that's not healthy for him. He doesn't, I don't think that's good for him. And it's certainly not good for me because it sends a message to me that, well, I don't deserve, say, people who treat me with respect. Um, so I chose to um, walk away and there was a few emails and messages exchanged after that but basically um, it's, it's out of, we just we just haven't spoken since then this was a year and a half ago now roughly probably more than a year and a half ago and so that's kind of where I sit with this stuff like like compassion um, you know I love him he's he's beautiful in a lot of ways he's got some great qualities but this to me is a, it's a, at least for me personally, it's a deal breaker. For someone else, it might not be. We can all choose what those are for us. For me, it is. And so at this point in time, and I also see too, like we talk about generational stuff. I'm all, if I'm like, if I let this continue into me, like I don't want to put this into my kids or people around me. I remember thinking about this at the time. Like if I have to never talk to him again to end this 
whatever this generational thing is that's been running through the family because it's these qualities so it's not just him it is a bit of a family thing if I have to break this contact for a while maybe forever to end this generational thing I'm willing to do that like it's that's more important to me than feeling like a good son or, or doing the politically correct thing that whatever most people think I should do um, and so to expand that for, for most people I think and this is where the nervous system stuff comes in like I think it's about safety. If I don't feel safe with someone, um, I don't think it's good for me to be around them. Like, I don't need to be a dick about it. I'm not going to get punch them in the face. But, you know, I've had it with people when, like, people say, you know, I start to get angry with someone. And in the past, they'd be like, oh, I'm just getting triggered. And now I'm usually, now it's usually like, oh, no, they're doing something. They're, like, fiddling. You know, like, a little, like, with their words. They're saying something. They're playing some game. And the anger is, like, a, to me, a sign that something's off. When I feel that, I won't use, I won't, unless they're really close to me, I won't usually talk to them. I'll just back off. I'm like, okay, not connecting with this person. Not going to you know, be around them. Um, so that to me is the balance. We still have compassion, or even with pedophiles, to use that as the example. The compassion can be, well, um, like you said, it's a generational thing. It's coming from, because they went through something like that. At the same time, however, it's like taking precautions. So it's like if someone is a pedophile, a known pedophile, probably don't want to have them with kids. That's not going to be a good good idea. You don't want to have them at churches where there are kids, in schools where there are kids. Uh, I think that's perfectly valid. Um, so it's like like with my dad, like I, I love him, I wish him the absolute best, but right now because of this this behavior pattern, I'm like, I can't be around him. It's just a, it's almost just a practical thing. It's not like, oh, fuck dad. It's more like, I like I love, love him, uh, but as long as that's there, I can't be in that situation um, with integrity. So, yeah. You mentioned something earlier, <clears throat> which I found interesting. When you were talking about these two people, um, you mentioned this idea that, like, right in the beginning, you had this intuitive sense that, mm -hmm. like, something was off, but you didn't listen to that. <clears throat> and then you also said something really interesting, which is, you've always considered yourself a very rational person. And then in retrospect, it's like, how did I fall for that? And, uh, you know, like for me, I think when, when we look at even most of the societies we come at at large, you know, often like that rationality, for example, it's in an archetypal way, it very much embodies what we would consider the masculine aspect. And that intuitive sense is more associated with the feminine. And, and I do think in general, probably women embody more of that intuitive sense. Men also have it. Um, but I think in a lot of our societies, that's been either bred out of us or we, we've lost connection with it. And women too. Like I think the reality is most women operate in, in the societies we come from much more from that rational perspective. They, they've lost that kind of inherent feminine, which, which men have too. Uh, kind of going back to the COVID example, uh, I, I found it very fascinating and also kind of logical in a way that many people who very much operate from the brain, from the rationality, I think we're much more susceptible to to certain propaganda or cultish behavior um, because there wasn't this intuitive sense that like something is off, something isn't adding up. They're saying this, but this is also true. This is happening. You know, you can't protest, but under certain circumstances, you can, because then the virus doesn't spread. Um, masks do work, but they, no, they don't work, but they do work. And now maybe they don't, you, you know, uh, natural immunity, it's always been a thing. Every, every scientist, doctor knows that, but all of a sudden for this one, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. But if there's enough information there from the rational mind, you can justify things, you can compartmentalize things, you can, as you said, like even be gaslit. Well, someone's telling me this, the intuitive sense is like screaming, but the rational mind is somehow justifying it. Um, do you think that's uh, like maybe that event was somewhat cathartic in a way and, and led you to, to some of the somatic work because maybe there was something inside that realized like, hey, this, this intuitive sense, this felt sense is actually super important, uh, like f for my well-being, you know, for my physical well-being, but also for like me as a person and that, that, that wholeness. Mm -hmm. 
you know, which is also what like healing means. It means coming into wholeness. And, and often it takes something to kind of shake us where we come out of balance. And then we look in retrospect and we're like, holy fuck, like that really took me out of balance. Like what, what do I need to get back into that, that wholeness? Mm-hmm. I mean, you mentioned rationalizing, like, I think that, that was very much what I was doing with these people where there was the feeling something's off couldn't put my finger on it but then I'd have my stories about oh but they're really nice people like we have this and we go out for this and blah, blah, blah. all these stories about all the reasons why I thought they were great um, <clears throat> so I was doing exactly what you what you were talking about and then yeah a big part of what that experience showed me was yeah the value of I mean like anger for one like I, like I said at that point up until that point I was never really angry it's probably never really emotional in general. But anger especially, I just didn't really get angry. And after that, it was like, oh, like, oh, my anger is like, it's a protective thing. Like, it needs to be contained, like, or understood. You don't want to be completely out of control with anger or with emotion. But, um, and, yeah, so that was, that was, it was the same thing with dad, like, or even just with people, about other people like that since then, where when, when something's off, it's always a fi- my body picks. I'll feel it long before I ever figure it out in my head, like that. <clears throat> I was at dinner one night with them. Um, doesn't matter who, but and uh, yeah, they were saying something, and I started to get angry. And so I was at first, I'm like, oh, I'm projecting, blah blah blah. And at some point, I'm like, oh no, they're they're fiddling. You know, this verbal like trying to fuck with me in the head, mind games. And I felt it long before the mind started to wrap, like started to piece it together. And go, oh, I see what they're doing. So it's the feeling. And so, yeah, it has been this, this, this you know, um, process of coming back to that. And the mind is still, you know, I get some great teachers here. They talk about this, but it's like, it's not about getting rid of the mind. There's a lot, like a lot of spirituality. I don't know if true spirituality is really about that, but sometimes it's like, get rid of your ego, get rid of the mind. If you think at all, you're... Um, you know, you're not spiritual or something like that. Where it's more about to me now is like balancing it. Having the mind do the things that the mind is great at, like storytelling or talking or something like that. But the feeling, the intuition, the gut, that comes through the body. Um, so yeah, it was definitely what kicked it off for me. Yeah, without, without the mind, we don't exist. <laughs> right, yeah. So, and it's funny, like, I mean, what I, you know, the way I tell people and sort of try and talk about this or explain it sometimes was up until that point, like I'd done my fair share of self-help stuff, you know, especially like the Western model of it, you know, like we are talking all the books, like Tony Robbins type of stuff. I meditated 20 minutes a day for almost 10 years on and off, but I'd say most of the time, more often than not, I was meditating every day. I journaled, I'd done different, you know, almost like a cognitive, you're familiar with like CBT, this kind of stuff, right? So like taking a belief, challenging it, changing it, doing different things like that with the mind. And there's, there's good stuff in all of it, absolutely. There's benefits and there's, there's cool things that come from all of that stuff. But when I started going into the body, this, you mentioned the somatic, so the somatic is a reference to the body rather than the mind. <clears throat> when I went, started going in that direction, it, like that's, that was like, oh, this is, this, that was like next level it was like in a whole other category. It's like, oh, we've got all this other stuff over here, which maybe meditation, I've had, had conversations with people where they're like, meditation's not about the mind, it's about the body. And maybe meditation done correctly is like that, but I think for a lot of Westerners, I know for me, I got very good at staying calm, you know, which is fine. I could probably quiet the mind a little bit, but it didn't mean I knew how to feel the body. It didn't mean I was better with my emotions. If anything, I was probably better at avoiding my emotions because I could, I could just turn off the mind and, and take a deep breath and I'd be calm. And so I think that a lot of the typical solutions that most people are familiar with, at least that I was familiar with at the time, just didn't come close. And I, like, I still got into that trouble with this couple. I'd done therapy, life coaching, all this stuff. And I still got caught up with these, um, with these life coaches. And then, you know, I started getting into the nervous system stuff, the somatic learning to work with the fight or flight response and that changed everything. So uh, kind of moving into the somatic work, how, uh, how would you define 
somatic work or somatic therapy or, or just that term? Um, <clears throat> this is part of my challenge right now, right? Like the reason why I wanted to do something with this, um, you know, build a business around it and teach it to people was because there's a lot of it. I don't know about a lot of it. There's, it's certainly around. Uh, I'm not the first one doing it by any means. If I was, I would never have learned it in the first place. But, um, but what I what I had seen so far or in the stuff I've read is it's it's amazing, amazing stuff. But how to explain it is the challenge. How to communicate it with someone who's never, you know, experienced it. That's the tricky thing. So when I say like, what is it about? <clears throat> um, there's a few parts, right? Part of it is the understanding the theory of the nervous system. So really it's the autonomic nervous system, the fight and flight response. That knowing how that works, that mechanism, most people have heard of fight or flight, but having like a deeper understanding of um, how that develops, um, how it develops certain issues, certain ways of responding to things from childhood, how it starts in, for example, like example of how interesting it can be is if our um, if we were when we when our mum was pregnant with us we're inside her belly if she's really stressed she's feeling a lot of fear when she's pregnant with us for whatever reason maybe she's married to a guy and their money's almost out and they can't pay their rent and she's stressing about that or who knows what or maybe that she breaks up she's a single mum pregnant mum and uh, she's scared so for whatever reason she's scared that's going to activate the fight or flight response in the nervous system of the mum, but because the baby's in the belly, it's going to activate it in the baby too. But because the baby can't run away or fight back because it's inside the belly, it then can move into freeze. So that fear, the end, it's really just energy, energy that's meant to drive a behavior, whether it's running away or fighting back. Because the way, how the, how the nervous system is going to do it is as the energy goes up and up and up and up, on like a bell curve, if it goes too high, and the person, the baby or the being can't run away and start to spend that energy. It can, it's like sending too much electricity through the house. It's like it can fry a circuit. So before it gets to that point, it'll freeze. It shuts the whole thing down. But that doesn't mean the fear, the energy, the stress goes away. It's more like it gets locked into the organs and the muscles and throughout the whole body. And so that's just an example of how, by understanding some of the, you know, how this fight or flight response works, why it goes into freeze, what happens when it does, can then help us to understand why we have certain issues, why some people might have like some kind of issues, like p symptoms of PTSD or like a like a stress issue uh, in the nervous system, like they're anxious all the time or they're depressed. And childhood was fine, but when mum was in the, when they were in mum's belly, mum was really stressed. Um, and so <clears throat> there's lots of that's just a quick like example, but just so that's one piece is understanding the theory of the nervous system, and. Um, Another reason for that is, is I think often when people start to feel, say if someone has a panic attack, they start to feel a lot of fear or a lot of anger, it can be quite overwhelming where people are, I don't want to feel this, this is uncomfortable, this is bad, this isn't meant to be happening, I don't like this. But when we can start to understand that this is just a stress response, this is how we've evolved to respond to threats, whether the threat is present right now, whether the threat is from when I was five years old or it's whatever, a lifetime of threats, just understanding that when we're having this energy come up, these feelings, it can help with um, getting rid of a lot of the fear of the fear or of the anger or of the shame, starting to go that it may not be about what's happening right now, maybe, but it may be about something that's happened a long time ago. And so the theory is a huge piece in my experience. It's been super helpful for me understanding that. And then with that theory then comes different techniques for taking the nervous system in different directions. Um, and the techniques are, I mean, it's, it's, in some ways it's not, it's not completely new. Like when I first um, started doing it in January, 2022, I remember thinking, oh, this is just like, you know, I'd read a book called The Presence Process, which is about just basically breath work. Once a day, you sit there for 15 or 20 minutes and you just, you just breathe, just like a different way of doing meditation. Um, it's, this is just like the presence process or Eckhart Tolle is the power of now or Michael Singer's the surrender experiment like all these systems that are trying to you know get people to feel it's the same thing but I remember thinking it's just better like it's so much better um, because of the it's almost like going from um, I, you know different ways of explaining it to people like I'd say like it's like going from like a pixelated TV to a like ultra high definition where now 
I'm doing the same thing in terms of being present, learning to feel, but because I have the theory, the science of the nervous system, I understand that. I can then design or understand, have better techniques for working with the different energy that's coming up. So rather than just having like a hammer and a nail, I have like a screwdriver and a drill and a shovel and like a whole toolbox of tools. Um, so like, like an, an example of something like that would be like a lot of meditation or, or stuff with stress. If you look online, it's take a deep breath. Take a deep breath will activate the parasympathetic nervous system and slow things down. And so that's the advice for stress. And it's taken for granted that that's the thing you do. But when we look at like, if you bring in the, th uh, the science of the nervous system, it goes, okay, well, if we're having a stress response starting to kick in and we're starting to activate, we're going into sympathetic, so the fight or flight response, sympathetic, we're starting to go up into that. How this works is if we shut that down prematurely, if that's kind of going up and then we take a deep breath and bring ourselves straight back into parasympathetic, what can happen is that stress that was the energy that was driving that stress response can then, instead of that getting discharged, it gets locked into the muscles in the body. So by taking a deep breath, we may actually be interrupting the completion of the stress response, which then means the stress response stays loaded into the muscles and the body and the mind, increasing general levels of, say, anxiety or depression or uh, you know, a mind that can't stop or different digestive because it goes into the organs, then we have autoimmune disorders and different things. And so this is what I mean about like sometimes taking a deep breath is perfect, but sometimes the best thing you can do is do not take a deep breath. You know, let things let things roll, let things keep going. Um, so and then another part, probably one of my favorite parts is is um, I the way I explain it to people is it's just like being in the body, out of the head, out of thinking, being in the body. And if someone said that to me before I found all this stuff, I'd be like, yeah, I kind of get it. I can meditate, blah blah blah. But then when I started playing with these techniques, it's like, oh, like I can feel it. I, I literally feel when I, so we can do it here. I can show, show people how to do it if you want, but um, <clears throat> explain how to do it. But when I started playing with it, it was like feeling like all my energy or all my soul, whatever you want to call it. It's like the physical is not really me feeling like whatever I am is, you know, like feeling the aura maybe you might say, or like the energy body or whatever the soul and it's like bigger than the actual physical body. And I remember thinking when I do these exercises, it's like I would feel this whole thing. Instead of being all concentrated around the head, the whole thing would just, it's like I'd land into the body and my energy would all of a sudden, instead of being concentrated in the head, it would start to fill up the arms and the legs. And it was a very like physical, like, oh, like I just landed. And uh, I never got that from any of that breath work stuff, any of the meditation. None of that ever taught me how to do that. And uh, so anyway, <laughs> just lots and lots of different things that I love about it. And, um, and on, on, when it comes to psychedelics, like I started doing this I think, in January 2020. And uh, I was just doing it because it was working well for me at the time. But I think a few months later, when I was probably about six months later, actually, I was at dad's place. I got some ayahuasca and I drank some ayahuasca. We had to drink ayahuasca out one night at home, one weekend. And um, I started playing with um, one of these techniques using sound, how to use sound to activate the, to start to tone the vagus nerve and um, activate the parasympathetic system. And once I, you know, that was cool on its own, but to do that with ayahuasca, I could feel like, I, as I made the sound, I can feel the, vibra the whole vibration as it moves through the entire body. And then I could send it, if I found like a place where it was tense or there was some butterflies in the stomach or something there, I could make these different sounds and it's like I could shift the energy using the sound or I could let the energy out, almost like sticking a pin in a balloon um, so the air can start to come out, the tension, the, the, you know, all that stuff can start to release. And so and that was, you know, another big moment where it was kind of going, wow, these psychedelics, especially like ayahuasca or San Pedro, are the ones that are specifically clean and heal, um, it's like this, it's the same thing. It's almost like in plant medicine, it's like the body's full of all this just stuff, energy we might call it from years, decades, from our lifetimes. And, um, you know, we drink some medicine and, and it comes up and then it comes out. You know, we purge it out, we might shake, there's different ways that the body does it. And then with the nervous system stuff, it's like, it's the same thing. It's, it's, I mean, it's using different language, different terminology, like, okay, we have survival stress, fight and flight that energy builds up. If it's not discharged or completed at the time, it gets stuck. 
that's what's in the body. It's keeping the body in like a, the nervous system in a perpetual state of say fight or flight or activation, which is why people can't stop thinking because they're scanning for threats and the way they worry about stuff. But by using different techniques to start to let all this energy out, the whole system starts to return to baseline. We sleep better, digest food better, um, and very similar to, um, to plant medicine. And I've even had like, with the nervous system stuff, I've had sessions, I was working with a guy one-on-one -on -one for a while, and um, he's actually related to these people in Thailand. And I said, look, I've just published the article, or I'm about to publish it, and I feel like all this anxiety, like, oh, I just, I don't just feel like they're gonna get me or something. Like, it was really scaring me, it was something tense. I told him about that, and, and so we worked with that, with these nervous system tools. And uh, for the first time, I, um, I threw up into a bucket in my office because I didn't expect and wasn't planning on it's just my office bin throughout all my breakfast um, and uh, it that was a huge like <laughs> that actually so there was that that day that threw something up and then it happened again two days later and then that weekend was when I had the big thing with my dad um, and since then we haven't spoken so it's like for my ex for me this like nervous system stuff has been every bit as powerful as plant medicine um, it, I don't tr I've never tripped or like you know had vision and stuff though I think that can happen but as far as like what it's been able to clear and, and help me process and release both with and without like both doing it at the same time as like using the techniques with plant medicine and also just doing it normally like I haven't had anything it's been every bit as powerful and as healing as drinking ayahuasca or San Pedro or any of it so you were using fear as an example, and fear, I think, is a really interesting thing. That I think often the way fear is spoken of, and, and I think it's it's the more widely accepted view of fear, which is that it's very useful. You know, like like if we see two Rottweilers running at us, fear is going to rise, and that that serves us. It, the, the adrenaline response, our muscles are primed to begin to run or to fight. Um. So it seems like most people, that's that's how they view fear, as something maybe that, as you said, we don't want to feel, but on a deeper sense, it, it's it's serving us. Mm -hmm. There's also another view, which, um, you know, you're mentioning like Eckhart Tolle and uh, probably Byron Katie you've heard of. Uh, and she gives a, an interesting example where she did have two Rottweilers running at her. And, and you know, a big part of her process is like questioning the mind. Mm -hmm. A thought arises like... I should run or I should fight, and but is that true? Um, and so she, from what I remember, she she th those thoughts were arising, and she just you know because usually answers that's not true, and and what are the reasons, and and so she just stood there and uh, without emotion, and these dogs came charging at her, and then in the moment where they came right up to her, they just started licking her. And another example I was reminded of, because you mentioned uh, Jocko, Jocko Willinks, uh, who I think is a really, uh, really good guy and, and a very good communicator. And uh, he was actually on the Lex Friedman podcast. And it was very interesting because Lex kept asking him these questions. I forget the exact line of questions, but it was something like, you know, are you afraid of climate and, and or, you know, climate change? And, or, you know, you kept using the word worry. Are you worried about climate change? And Jocko was like, no. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, it seems like it's a big issue. And he's like, yeah, but I'm not worried about it. Like, maybe these are the things we can do, da, da, da. And he's like, well, were you worried about the gun issue? And Jocko's like, no. And he's like, yeah, but it seems like it's a big issue. And he's like, well, you know, there's things you can do. And he's like, are you worried about this? And finally... You know, it seemed like it took him a while, but he understood what, what Jocko was saying is it's not that he doesn't necessarily think these things aren't an issue, but he's not worried about them. He's not worried about them because he realizes the worry isn't serving him in being able to implement things that actually fix that. So to me, that, you know, that seems like a, a, a contrarian view. Like one side is saying fear is very useful, like it's serving you, uh, that there's a use behind it, like learn from it. And the other side is maybe saying fear isn't serving me. It's something that's actually getting in the way. And if I can realize that, then I can actually act in a more precise way. Like I'm not acting from fear. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you have any any yeah. thoughts on that because fear is a big response. You know, kind of like we were talking earlier. I mean, uh, 
with, with plant medicine work. I, you know, from my experience, I've, I think fear is, is the most powerful, what most people would consider negative emotion, mm-hmm. you know, which is even where I think like anger comes from. Anger, I think, is like a, a, the root of it is actually a fear. Um, you know, there's the existential fear, which, which most people, whether they realize it or not, is like, what happens when I'm no longer here? Mm-hmm. Um, and for any normal human being, fear is going to arise. And, you know, so much of plant work, I think all of the times we have really difficult experiences, there's something around fear that's coming up. A lot of people, we, they, they, they can't necessarily name it or they don't put their finger on this as fear, but I think at the root... There's a very deep fear that, that everyone is is dancing with. Um, so yeah, I guess the question is is something around that, like like how how do you see fear? Do you, do you see it as, as a use and something to to be learned from and to master? Uh, and is there a point where maybe fear no longer serves us and and there can be a I don't know like a containing of it? Mm. Well. I mean, I look at most things like this through the, this nervous system lens these days, but I mean, you mentioned Byron Katie with the thoughts, like there's, a, there's an interesting thing with like, when we think something, we can create a feeling. So we think these dogs are going to eat me and start to create some fear to run away or, or we can be afraid, which can then create the thought. So that it goes both ways. We, through the mind, we can affect the body. Through the body, we can affect the mind. To an extent, I don't know if that works with everything, because it depends if the thought is what's creating the fear in the first place. Uh, in the case of like when I think about like like some of these situations when I've been with people who are manipulative or they're playing these games, and I start to feel something, whether it's fear or anger, so I've had both. A lot of times, that's not. I don't think that's ever really been a. If if it's the mind in those cases, in those situations, for me, it's the mind going. No, no, you're projecting. No, you're just making this up. No, they've just triggered you. Blah. That's my different stories. Um, but if I just feel, just pure feeling, just feeling what's there, with having no stories, no ideas, no thoughts in my head about what it means, just feeling the instinctual reaction to it, that to me, I think is very protective. And I think it's natural and normal. I imagine Jocko would feel that too. Like when he's rolling jujitsu with someone and he's, you know, you know, of course, jujitsu. You know, we both do jujitsu, but and so there's an element of staying calm. But then, if we weren't afraid of getting choked, even just a little bit, um, we might get choked a fair bit more. If we weren't afraid of getting injured, if we weren't afraid of these different things, we might be a little bit more cavalier about how we roll. Same with driving. Same with everything. So I think fear is very protective. It's just like anger, right? So like with anger. But do you think, sorry to interrupt, like with the Jujutsu example, like with Jaco, like I think what he's pointing to is he's saying, if I, fear can arise, but there's a knowing that that fear then isn't serving me. So the, also kind of going back to rationality, mm-hmm. it's knowing that I don't want to get choked because I don't want to lose or I don't want to hurt my neck. But if the fear is there, then maybe that's actually hindering me. Mm-hmm. It's almost like it's some of the, like the fear isn't so much the issue; it's the reaction. It's like the fear of the fear, because often when people are afraid, they I think the worry can be a way to try and control the fear. They're not comfortable feeling the feeling. So I've seen this in myself. When I'm usually worried about, I'm worrying about money, or I'm worrying about this, or like just any of a million different things. Usually because I think that by somehow if I could worry about it enough, I could think about it enough, I could figure it out, and then the feeling will correct itself. It'll relax. And I've learned over time that that just keeps it going. And so I wonder if what Jocko's in some ways talking about, it's not that he doesn't have fear or it's just not there at all. It's just that he just doesn't care. He's not going to sit there and worry about it to try and fix the fear. He's comfortable with the feeling. It's okay. You know, it has its own teaching, but it doesn't control him. Um, that's probably how I would, you know, in the Jocko case. So it's not, in that sense, it's not about not having fear or not having emotion. It's about having the emotion sitting in its proper place and having the correct relationship with it where we're not trying to... Because in a lot of ways I would even say like... Or even like I would, when I used to work one-on-one with this guy, like I'd go to him and say, look, I figured out like this issue, like it's because of this when I was however old as a kid, blah, blah, blah. And he'd be like, cool, man. You ready to feel? And then the rest of the hour we'd just spend 
you know, feeling. And, um, you know, but time has taught me that like often people, when I'm worried about something, I'm not really actually feeling fear. I'm just worrying. It's kind of like in ceremony um, where whether, whether the emotion and these days, like I've started to see a lot of the stuff is it's not even, I feel like fear or anger is like cannot, can sometimes, I don't know all the time, but can sometimes be too, it comes with baggage. Like it, it's almost like at its core, it's just the sensation in the body. If we get down to like the root, the most basic first principle of what it is, it's an experience of tightness or um, bracing or like butterflies, you might say. It can be like a cool feeling and the sensation can be static. It can be moving around. Like that to me, when people say feeling fear, you can't fear as a concept or an idea. And to feel the actual sensation of it, which is a lot of what the nervous system approach is about, is getting away from the stories and the labels of its fear and its anger and it's this and it's that. And so when we, yeah, so we call it fear, that's not really saying what it is. If I say, well, I feel this really cold feeling in my stomach and it's moving around and it's quite diffuse, it's not very sharp, um, that's starting to get closer to the actual direct, raw experience and say, like sensory experience of it. But if I'm worrying about how am I going to pay the rent next month? How am I going to do, like, what am I going to do about climate change or whatever? I'm really just thinking. And this is what, this has come out of the plant medicine stuff too, which is why I think these two things go so well together. But it's the same with the plants. I can be in ceremony thinking I'm feeling something. And I'm actually just thinking. I'm thinking about, I'll be caught up in something. And of course, the thinking can be creating the feeling. But as long as I'm thinking, I'm only really thinking. So to worry about climate change is not really to feel afraid of climate change. Does that make sense? It's like a subtle distinction. But I think a lot of people would say, oh, I'm so angry. Um, oh, I'm, I'm really feeling really anxious. And it's like, are you or are you just thinking a lot? You know? Because if people can get down to that raw root sensation, maybe that's what Jocko's okay with. Is he, he's, happy to, he's either happy to feel it or... Yeah, Jocko's a special case, I think. He also has a thing where he says... I think in one of his videos or whatever, you know, if, and I think you must learn this being a SEAL or being in the army where it's like, if you can't control it, don't worry about it. Because when they're in these very high stakes environments, I mean, they learn a ton of stuff about like those kinds of things. If like we have limited energy to worry about stuff. Let's focus on the things we can control that are going to make a difference to the mission that are going to keep someone alive. Everything else has to go. Uh, so perhaps he's, like, he's got very good mental discipline in that sense that the average Joe, civilian, has never had a reason to develop. Uh, that could be another part of it. Yeah, it's interesting with, with jiu-jitsu, like you were talking about with Jaco, because, of, you know, for me, but I think for a lot of people, like a big part of jiu-jitsu is energy conservation. And the more energy we're expending, eventually there, there's a cost to that, which eventually means you lose, which you know, in an ultimate sense means you die because that's, you know, that's ultimately what it's, it's replicating. And it's interesting with worry because I, I think a lot of people probably feel that is that worry, it's taking up a lot of energy, like it's taking up a lot of time. There's this rumination, as you were saying, and, and I think very much the quality of worry or fear is, is very much like, like thinking or projecting into the future, you know, and then it seems like the nervous system responds to that because there's not something I can actually do. And so this energy begins to build up. And as you said, that the, the muscles may be tightened or the stomach, the digestion, you know, and, and that's a form of energy. It's beginning to tax us. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I would imagine, like you said, like someone like Jaco, like when you are in these like kind of like life and death situations, like where you do have to be very mindful of your energy uh, you know, much like jujitsu, like also when you're practicing at the highest levels, like any extra energy you're expending, it's something that eventually can come back and like bite you in the tail. Because mm -hmm. if the other guy has that little bit extra energy, then ultimately he wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, Jay says, you get him drunk before you take the money. <laughs> and, uh, it's funny with jujitsu, it's more of a tangent, but you know, I've noticed because, you know, I've done all this nervous system stuff. I, I like to think I can stay pretty calm in jiu-jitsu, but um, calmer than people at my level at least. But even then, technique, like maybe you know, energy, um, energy management, breath control, whatever. You know, it gives me a slight advantage, but if someone's technique is 
a couple of years ahead. It doesn't do much. Um, so just that little interesting side note with <laughs> I've tried so hard to become. But on the other, I'd like to, to expand on what you said like people worry and they, they might be aware that all this worrying is spending lots of energy and they end up tired and um, so they try and stop worrying they start to meditate or they start to journal they do these different things and I've done it hoping that that's going to stop the worry in the mind and this is where the nervous system thing has been so useful for me at least is because instead of going okay the problem is I worry too much. Instead of looking at it that way, or where I've come to with the nervous system stuff, the way I tend to see it now is if I'm worrying about anything, it usually means that I'm in some amount of sympathetic activation. So I'm in some fight or some amount of fight or flight. That could be because something happened today. You know, I had an argument with someone, someone cut me off in traffic, whatever. Something happened today. Or it could just be that there's some my system is perhaps permanently in that state because I've got a lot of stress. It's just built up. It's accumulated. Um, and so how I see worry in a lot of ways is, you know, we think about worry about the climate, worry about politics, worry about COVID, worry about money. Um, I started to wonder, and I tend to believe that we don't really, we're not really worrying about all this. We are worrying about all these different things. And we might think we have these different issues. Oh, I've got a COVID problem and I've got a money problem and I've got a politics problem. I need to move countries so we can get some new politicians or whatever. But how I see it now with the nervous system is what if all of that, all of those different worries and thoughts are like leaves on a tree and the root of the tree is the level of activation in the nervous system. And so if I'm in some amount of fight or flight, right, that essentially means I don't feel safe, right? If I'm in fight or flight, you think about where it's really been generated as, as we've evolved, living in the jungle or living in the bush, a bear comes along, a, a tiger or whatever, we feel the fear, we feel the anger, whatever, we try and run away, we attack. And it's all driven by a sense of, I'm not safe. Which we could say is, yeah, even underneath anger is in some ways, it's all about, <laughs> you could call it unsafety, fear. To me, it's about safety or not feeling safe, either safe or unsafe. And if we don't feel safe, that's when, okay, we're going to start to feel that activation to run away, to attack, or whatever. And if we're feeling unsafe, um, one of the automatic ways that we will, that mammals, find safety again is we orient. You can, animals do this. You watch cats and dogs. Humans do it too. I think everything probably does it. Um, as soon as there's a sound, if there's like a novel... It's a well-established thing in the scientific literature. It's a, it, if you have like an environment in terms of sounds and you're used to kind of, like it's quite quiet in here, right? If we heard a big bang outside, we'd probably both play like, what? If you'd never heard it before, you live here, right? So let's assume it's a sound that neither of us has ever heard here before. We're probably gonna be like, what was that? Like, check it out. It'll be so automatic and so unconscious, we're orienting towards it. We're essentially, we're scanning. We're scanning the environment to see, is it a threat? Is it not a threat? And if it's not a threat, oh, okay, false alarm. Let's continue the conversation. If it is a threat, okay, we need to go out there and deal with this thing, right? We need to put out the fire. We need to jump in the car and run away from the aliens or whatever it happens to be. So when we're feeling unsafe, the point is that we will automatically, on systems wide, to start to scan for threats. It's gonna to start to look around. So if you can find the threat, because what the system, the nervous system is trying to do is get back to safety. It's like this genuine, it's really beautiful really. It's this tendency, this desire to go back to wholeness, to go back to peace. And we do it without thinking. We're scanning for threats. Now the reason I think people worry is uh, I imagine that for most people, in most families, in most societies today, especially in the Western world, it's stressful. You know, parents are stressed when they're raising kids. You've got... Um, just everything that happens in childhood. Most people, I don't know anyone who's, who's had a perfect childhood where everything was fine. And if they did, I'm sure there'd be something buried somewhere. Um, and then you've got the the general low level, but chronic stress that we live, you know, a lot of people, we don't live in it, but a lot of people live in it, say like say New York or Sydney or fast paced mortgages, all this sort of stuff. And so people are, the way I look at it is a lot of people are living in, in a permanent 
permanently elevated sense of activation in the nervous system. They're, they're, they don't really ever come down into parasympathetic, which is why they might need alcohol, weed, whatever, to sleep. Um, that's why they might have digestive problems, autoimmune disorders, blah, blah, blah. And so the worry, to me, is we scan the environment, we don't even think about it, but we're feeling unsafe, fear, anger, whatever it is, we're feeling unsafe. To me, it's the unsafety. We scan the environment, okay, I can't see anything immediately present. There's no tigers, there's no dragons, there's no hurricanes, whatever, here right now. So obviously the threat's not here. But then we use our mind, our neocortex, our imagination. Okay, maybe it's out there. Maybe it's because I don't have enough money. Maybe it's because I don't have enough friends. Maybe it's because I don't have enough likes on Facebook or whatever. And so instead of scanning physically, we start scanning mentally. And I think still, it's still driven by the same desire. We're still trying to get back to safety. It's still, it's still a desire to get back to, really it's about getting back to parasympathetic, to that, ah, oh, I'm safe, safety. And um, that to me is why people, a big part of why people worry. And if they knew how to find safety, if they could cultivate safety, if they could, in the nervous system, what they call it, resourcing. So a resource is anything that soothes or settles the system. So take someone down out of fight or flight, down into parasympathetic, rest and digest. So what we're, we're probably in right now, talking, eating, uh, like a very relaxed state. And so the thinking, we could think, is it's an attempt at a resource. It's an attempt to soothe. It's an attempt to bring someone out of fight or flight. And if you can give someone another way to do that, another tool, different tools, better tools, such as just look around the room that you're in and see if it's safe. That's one of the, the starting or the most basic tools you learn in, in the nervous system work is orienting to the safety in the environment, regardless of what's actually happening in the world, just looking around the room or the space that you're in, seeing if it's safe. And this won't fix all your problems straight away, but it can start to bring some of that activation down. And as that starts to come down, we start to come out of fight or flight and into parasympathetic, into the rest and digest state. The need to worry, these worry, these thought loops about everything just start to dissolve. Doesn't mean they're gone forever, of course, because we're, you know, life is we go up and down. We want to be able to go into fight or flight, it's necessary. But we want to be able to come down too. And so as we learn to do that and we get better at doing that, the need to worry about everything uh, becomes decreased, it lessens. Gradually, it can be quick, it, it is a very gradual process. It's not a magic bullet, you press a button and you're done. Um, so, and this is why when I think about like say meditation for example, why I was able to quiet the mind perhaps, but was not actually probably dealing with the actual activation in the system. So I could silence the mind, but I'm not actually finding safety. So that mind stops but my activation remains. And so that's why I think it didn't, it didn't really resolve some of these issues. It didn't fix some of these things, but learning how the nervous system works and doing safety and that was what really made it shift. So that's one example of, of how you can begin to work with uh, somatic work. If, if someone comes to you, um, what are some of the ways, like what are some of the techniques that, that, that can be worked with in that, that somatic framework to begin to work on the parasympathetic nervous system or to begin to break people of some of these patterns of, of an overactive mind or an overactive digestive system or overactive heart? Um, um, well, part of it is like the, the safety thing, like I said. Um, part of it is the theory, so understanding the fight or flight response, how when there's a threat, which can be lack of money can be these different things it's going to can bring the system up into fight or flight and just knowing that can start to bring some awareness or context to why we're feeling certain things or if someone's feeling anxious or depressed or you know depressed uh, depression can be you know, we can think of that as like a almost like a malfunctioning of the freeze response someone's stuck in freeze and they can't feel anything they're completely numb it's very very like depression so having the nervous system framework i think is um it's, the, it's theoretical and yet it's also practical because it changes the way we relate to what we're feeling. So that's part of it. And then as far as techniques go, uh, a very simple thing is understanding this, this idea of resourcing, which this is not anything new. Uh, we all have different things that we do to relax. Some people are just better at it or they're better at doing it in a healthy uh, way than other people. Like, um, like I said, a resource can be anything, is anything 
that helps the system start to settle and, uh, and come down out of fight or flight. So that can be, say, alcohol, uh, weed, marijuana, um, various drugs, cigarettes, uh, junk food, can be all these different things, absolutely. But the problem with some of these things, aside from their obvious health consequences, is that they work by, instead of helping the, regulate, the, the activation come down, they do do that, but how it works is it disconnects us from what we're feeling. And it's almost that the, by disconnecting, the system can start to relax a little bit. We're not actually working through it or releasing it. It's just almost like a, I'm just not gonna think about that for a while. I'm not gonna focus on that. And that can be necessary, or it is necessary. That's why people do it. They don't have any better option. But over time, the goal is to, um, if people wanna be healthier, is to, is to learn how to resource, to soothe the system in ways that don't disconnect. So say like alcohol is a depressant, it's gonna, it, it will <laughs> cause things to relax, but it does it at the cost of a connection to feeling, a connection to ourselves. So it's not, it comes with, all, and then the health stuff, it comes with negative consequences. However, going for like a walk, say in a park, in nature, can be very different. You know, we can stick with not, but it's not so intense or so um, the, way that, the way that its mechanism doesn't work by disconnecting us completely. We're still with us, ourselves, we're still feeling, but we're now with nature as well. So it's a different kind of, um, doesn't come with the same kinds of negative side, negative aspects that say alcohol or cigarettes or junk food or porn come with, right? Um, so I think it can be things like, it's gonna be different for everyone, but some things that I think probably work for most people are gonna be walking in nature, talking to a really good friend. Uh, if, if you talk, speak to a friend who's really calm, there's uh, something called co-regulation, where if someone else is calm and you're stressed and you go talk to the calm person and they're good at staying calm, you will naturally start to, you'll co-regulate with them. Your nervous systems will start to sync up. So if they're calm, you'll start to calm down just by talking to them. Um, so that's one, talking to a good friend, um, music. I love to, and even talking itself, talking uh, activates, because if we're running from a bear, we're usually not gonna be having a conversation with someone. We're gonna have to be more relaxed to have a conversation with someone. So if we know that, then simply talking Having a meal with someone is something we do when we're relaxed. So having a meal and talking with someone can be, again, another way to resource because it's going to activate like, part of how it works, the mechanism. It's going to activate the vagus nerve, uh, which activates the parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest state, that relaxed state. So I like to sing as well, singing um, with my guitar. I find that's, a, that's an incredible way to have this. I can feel what it's doing and it really brings the nervous system down. Because again, there's no way I would be doing that if I was running from a bear. Uh, so it's like a way to send a message to my nervous system that, hey man, it's okay, it's safe right now. So it's, that's one, uh, another really useful aspect is, again, it's not something, uh, it's something we all do already is this relaxing, doing different things to relax. But having the, I find having the language of resourcing starts to make it more conscious. And we can go, the next time we feel activated or stressed or in fight or flight, that's where we're bringing in some of the no, uh, theory of the nervous system, we can go, hang on, I don't really care about the alcohol or the TV or the porn or the junk food. What I'm actually seeking is to get more into parasympathetic. Oh, okay, how do I do that? Well, I can drink alcohol and that might help, but I'm gonna have a hangover tomorrow. What if I see if it's safe in the environment and uh, have a cup of tea and really pay attention to the tea and then I'll go for a walk outside in the field with the dog, you know? And so it's starting to see that what I'm really seeking is not, <clears throat> is not the thing that I'm craving but very often it's this relaxation and there are other better ways to do that. And so that's another thing. Um, and another thing that I love to teach people first and really to me, what I teach people, it's really just this bit developed, um, made more, um, just deepened I suppose, but um, it's three things really. It starts with three things anyway. It starts with looking around so you can look for the safety in the environment, looking around the room, the space that you're in. Feeling the ground, the surface, the chair, the bed, the feet on the ground, and then noticing the breath. And um, part of that, part of the way that works is again, we're talking about orienting, so scanning around. If we're, uh, we're feeling unsafe, part of what we'll be doing is our eyes will dart around. If you look like, look at cats or birds, when they're a bit skittish, you know, the head moves fast, the eyes move really fast as they look around. So that's a sign that they're in fight or flight. If they were relaxed, what would they be doing? Looking around slowly, 
kind of like the, I don't know if cats look at sunsets, but they probably just like, you know, the head moves really slowly, the eyes move really slowly. And so understanding how the body um, behaves when it's relaxed and then doing that can then again start to bring in some of these parasympathetic aspects because it sends the message to the body, to the nervous system, it's safe, it's safe right now. And we're doing it without thinking. We're not thinking a thought I'm safe. We're acting as though it's safe, as long as it is safe. Because if there was a dog there, maybe we would want to need to run away, unless we're Byron Katie, of course. Um, and so then where it gets really interesting, and this is my favorite thing to do, and I still do it now, it just develops and gets more, but is to look around and to feel the ground and then to feel the breath and to weave these three things together. So can I see... Can you see, can you stay paying attention to the visual source, the eyes, what the eyes are seeing, while also feeling the chair and the ground and noticing the breath at the same time? And I don't know what it is, man, but I'd love to, I don't know if, the, I haven't seen, I and mean, there might be some science out there on this, but that specific technique, and you can iterate on this in so many different ways where it's like, what else do we bring in, like some gentle head turning? Uh, what if we bring in like some, you know, hand movements, and you, so you can increase the complexity in different ways to drive it. Probably it's probably building like a new neural pathway in the brain. So by making it more complicated, more complex, it makes it more. We develop it becomes a better skill. But that basic idea of weaving, it seems to be seeing ground, breath, or even sometimes seeing and feeling what's happening internally, balancing the external with the internal at the same time. That to me is the like linchpin skill of the nervous system, like the somatic, whatever you want to call it, that work of being in the body, it's that. Because that to me, like I'm three and a half years into it, um, almost three and a half, and that one, that one basic technique, which can be iterated on and developed in a million different ways, that is what, like when I'm, when something's moving through, when there's, you know, aggression energy that comes through the body sometimes, or fear, different things, it always comes back to, can I see? feel the ground can I stay tuned in stay in the body feeling it while that's happening um, I, yeah again I don't know exactly why it works but in my experience and I've seen it with other people too if they learning how to do that it's like the linchpin skill and it starts with that the most basic version of it I suppose is look around feel the ground and breathe and with the breath don't take a deep breath see if you can just notice the breath without trying to control it doing that together and then building upon that and getting better at doing that when you're driving, working, dishes, eating. Yeah. And then as that happens, a lot of the somatic stuff is, there's techniques for shaking, shaking the system up to bring things up, but a lot of it is getting better at this, building the capacity to stay embodied in the body with these techniques and then things start to move when they're ready. So we don't need to, for most of the time, well, you never really need to force it. Sometimes we can nudge it in different directions. But a lot of it's just getting better at being here. Um, and not in a meditation sense. With your eyes shut, where you drift off. This is what I know I can do. If I have my eyes shut, I'm, it's like I'm there, but I'm not. It's very different. Something about the eyes open and the ground and the breath is where it's at. Are you familiar with this book? Uh, it seemed to be one of the... I think the first pieces of literature to really point to a lot of this stuff in a in maybe a more scientific or medical way, which was um, why zebras don't get ulcers. Yeah, I haven't read it. What's that dude's name? Yeah, I've heard it. I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It I, seemed a lot about that, like why, you know, you were saying mammals, but but uh, kind of this idea that that. And again, it's. Uh, I don't think we can necessarily say whether they experience fear or not, but but presumably either they do or they're experiencing like certainly a, a flight response, like mm -hmm. a, when a, when a zebra is being chased by a lion, you know, its eyes are dilating, it's 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 in full flight mode, um, and if it escapes, the kind of the the premise of the book. I mean, a very short premise, but. Is that once it escapes and it finds safety, which which you said, then it, it begins to shake and it you know it kind of shakes that that 
that tension, that anxiety, that, that pent-up energy out, and then it continues about its day as if nothing happened. And, and kind of, again, the premise is that as humans, we don't do that, mm-hmm. like, because we're, we're taking in all of this, this stimuli from, from the world, and because we don't necessarily, we haven't been taught or we don't have these tools to allow it to release, it begins to become pent up. And, mm-hmm. you know, eventually, that's why he's saying why zebras don't get ulcers is that eventually it can lead to ulcers, or as you said, autoimmune conditions, heart disease, anxiety, depression, and so on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've seen there's this great video on YouTube, which um, I'm going to send you if you want to link on the on the website. But um, it's a gazelle. Uh, it's that same idea. Gazelle cheetah turns up. Cheetah chases the gazelle. Gazelle goes into flight, right? And just starts trying to run away. Cheetah case. Ca- cheetah catches the gazelle, and uh, by the neck. So obviously the gazelle's like, well, fuck, I'm dead. I'm basically, I'm not dead yet, but I'm about to die. So the gazelle goes into freeze. That shutdown response. So it's basically numb. It can't, you know doesn't really feel anything as far as we know. Um, it's basically paralyzed, it's not moving as long as the cheetah's there. It's almost like a, a preparing for death. That's one way scientists, I think, or some people have looked at it. It's like a, almost like a gift from the universe or Mother Earth, wherever. Right before in this high stress thing, the system shuts down and there's no feeling at all. Like the soul, can, I don't know if animals have souls, but leaves the body. Uh, and then a hyena comes along. And the hyena's like, couldn't have caught the gazelle in the first place on its own, but now that the, the hyena's bigger than the, than the uh, cheetah. So it's like, well, I'm, I'm want you, I want your lunch now. And the cheetah has to be like, well, okay, I can't, I'm not going to win against in a fight against you. So the, while the cheetah and the hyena are sort of squabbling, the gazelle comes out of freeze, back into flight, and bolts away and gets to safety. And it's, yeah, it's like what you said, but I guess with some added pieces where it's like, yeah, it'll get caught, it goes into freeze. So... The energy, the stress response goes all the way up. It's a peak arousal, I'd say peak activation. And when it goes into freeze, it doesn't go back down and then go into freeze. It's like it freezes at the top. So we think about someone who's, say, depressed or numb or an animal who's in flight. They might look like they're perfectly still and they're not moving very much and they're not expressing very much. But beneath that shutdown response is an enormous amount of energy. So then, you know, you think about someone who's depressed, right? If they can unlock that and get that unstuck, the amount of energy that comes out of that. I've seen this with plant medicine in my own life where the more I feel through this stuff, it's almost like different pieces can be frozen in the system. The more I release all of that, the more energy there is in me for everything, for my life. Uh, and then so, the, yeah, the gazelle runs away and then... Um, also, unlike humans, it doesn't go to a bar afterwards and have a few beers and talk about what happened that day. You know, that doesn't talk about that night, doesn't talk about it next week, never talks, never probably thinks about it ever again. It's just present in the moment. Whereas as humans, we have these experiences and we don't. Um, one example I heard was, it's like an human example, it was like you're seven years old, you're riding your bike down the street and you crash and it really fucking hurts. You're scraped, all scraped up. And um, there's sort of diff- different ways of responding where one way is to do what the zebra uh, in your story would have done, which is to maybe get up and walk across to the road, to the side of the road where it's safe, so get to safety. And then if there's emotion that needs to be expressed, it might be crying, maybe it means it hurts or crying or out. Uh, it might be like angry at the bike or at the road or at something, so rah, growling or something like that. Uh, or even maybe it is just shaking, just some fear, right? In that moment, right in that moment when that, that experience happens, just again, it's just allowing whatever wants to take place to take place. That would be one way to do it. And maybe some people come over and like, are you okay? Like, no, I'm really not. I just, you know, and then you just, you let yourself feel. And of course, when you're seven years old, it's probably going to depend on how your parents have raised you. But another response this is, I feel like this would probably be the more typical response in the Western world is that happens to a kid. And um, instead of making space for whatever wants to come up, the shaking or whatever, they get up and, and they try and act like, no, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, it's okay. And they get back on the bike and they ride home or something like that. And they, they mum or dad, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Whatever. Or maybe if they are upset, dad says, boys don't cry or some, you know, different, there's different programs that we get told, right? And so it's like that zebra example, but for humans, that we have these stressful experiences, but often we, or as adults, you know, 
someone goes and has a glass of, you know, a couple of beers, you know, if they have a breakup or something like that, it's like we're, we don't usually, we're not very good as a culture at allowing these things to happen. And we shame people around us when they do, they're probably because them, you know, this happens in plant medicine, right? If someone's, some one person triggers another person. So if one person's sad, it's instead of feeling your own sadness, it's easy to tell them they're a pussy, you know, boys don't cry, blah, 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 yeah, whatever, you know. Do you have thoughts on the role of uh, pharmaceuticals? Because it seems like that's something that a lot of people turn to instead of turning towards uh, therapies such as somatic therapy mm-hmm. or, or plant medicine or sports or exercise. There's, we live in cultures now where, where there is kind of this rational reductionist thinking that, that any problem is simply, for example, like a chemical imbalance and therefore there's this drug which we take to, to hopefully, re- hopefully regulate that. And I mean, I heard at one point, I, I don't know if it's true or if it's still true, but like, for example, in the U.S., like one in three young boys is on yeah. pharmaceutical, uh, like SSRI uh, medicine, uh-huh. things like Ritalin, Prozac, um, because often there's this view that, that maybe, for example, for that young boy, he's too overactive or he's not concentrating, he's not sitting at his desk properly. So he needs to be regulated. Um, but, you know, it seems like there's, there's a huge issue there because those, those pharmaceuticals have, uh, like all pharmaceuticals, they, they're medicine and they also have side effects. And often those side effects can be quite deleterious. Um, you know, without going into too much, I mean, you even like recently there was a, another school shooting in the U.S. and it, it, it seems to be this 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 correlation where a lot of these people are on these psychoactive drugs, and and it seems like one of the things it's doing is it's not making them feel. Um, you know, they're like who would go in and and murder a bunch of people? Like in general, there's there's a lack of feeling, there's a lack of empathy, there, there, there's something that's disconnected, there's something that's not embodied in that person. Um, but it also seems as societies we're, we're, we're moving you know, to this pharmacological view where instead of maybe trying to bring things into a balance through different means of regulation, we're, we're turning to, to, to pharmaceuticals. And you see that a lot with anxiety, with depression. Um, you know, and, and there's even been some, some research coming out uh, about the inefficacy of uh, antidepressants. And again, it's not to say that, that they can't be useful, that they don't have a use, but it seems like on the whole, they're actually not very effective. And, mm. and even some things like exercise uh, seems to actually have a better result than these pharmacological drugs. Mm. I mean, I'm not a... Uh I'm not a doctor or chemist or any of that, but you know, I've never taken antidepressants um, personally. But from what I've seen and people that I know, I have one person who's very close to me, um, and uh, she she was having panic attacks, you know, severely depressed and anxious and panic attacks for a good few years. And uh, she got on antidepressants. And I guess at the time it was probably necessary. I'm not sure. I'm, yeah, maybe she would probably say it was useful at the time because she didn't, she needed something. She was suicidal, um, very much so. And so she, at that point she hadn't you know, explored plant medicine and, and say the nervous system stuff. She's since gotten into all of that. But when I ask her about it, the way she describes it, is that what I do remember is um, that it was like, yeah, it's, 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 she didn't feel like herself anymore. She didn't really feel that much, like you said. So she was, wasn't really suicidal. She didn't get the panic attacks. She wasn't anxious. But she also didn't feel much joy, you know, or excitement or passion or purpose or fulfillment. It's the, and I've heard other people describe, describe them like this too, where... It just evens everything out, where you know, instead of the, you know, feeling the emotional ups and downs of life, everything is just the same. Which, to someone who's probably quite depressed and anxious and suicidal, 
to go from that to feeling okay, I imagine would be an absolute lifesaver. And in many cases it probably is in the sense that if they didn't get that pill or the antidepressant at the time, maybe they would kill themselves. I'm sure there, there would be you know, we have enough people in the world where that would happen and has happened, I'm sure. Um, but as far as does it deal with the actual root problem, the people I've spoken to who've been on them, like the way I, my perception of it and the, the feedback I've heard from them is that it didn't resolve anything. It was a Band-Aid in the sense that it, um, like a painkiller in a way, like it even you know got rid of the pain, we might say, but it didn't resolve the root issue. Uh, and when, when they came off the uh, antidepressants, all the shit, they might not have been um, still as anxious or as depressed once they came off, but all the stuff that caused it in the first place was still there. And so it sounds, my impression or my probably perspective on it at the moment is that if someone needs, if it's an emergency and uh, someone doesn't know what else to do and they need some time to catch their breath, to make some space, to focus, to maybe go and learn some, some, some of the somatic stuff, and then when they're a bit stronger or when they're feeling a bit more uh, resilient, then to either tapering off and figuring out a way to get off and then working through whatever's there. But my understanding of it, again, I'm not a doctor by any means, uh, my understanding of it is that they're not resolving the root issue. Um, and let, I suppose in some cases, if I don't know enough about the chemistry of it, but the, the I can't remember, a fancy word or phrase for it, but this, um, like the theory, well, a hypothesis, I think, more of a hypothesis than a theory, um, that it's all just brain getting you out of whack neurochemicals. I don't know if that's, um, from what I've seen anyway, that's not really what's going on. That might be an effect or a downstream, yeah, like a symptom of the real problem, but I don't think, from what I've seen, I don't think that's the real issue. Uh, the real issue is, is what we've talked about here. From what I see is it's unresolved trauma. You know, I haven't used that word at all today. I don't like to use the word trauma because so many people have different ideas about it. But in the nervous system world, all trauma means it's not the event, it's not whatever happened to someone. It's the accumulated stress. For It's like the response to the event. So trauma is not what someone went through. It's how their system, how their nervous system responded to it. And really the energy that it generated and that was not able to release at the time. So that zebra, it wasn't, in, to use uh, using these definitions, it wasn't. It's not trauma or traumatic for the for the uh, zebra to get chased by a tiger or whatever, even caught, even that gazelle. It only becomes traumatic or trauma when they aren't able to discharge the or complete the stress response that was begun. You know when that happened, because when that happens, then the the energy, the stress that that wanted to be discharged into a bag, into running away, for example, is stuck. And so in this world, it's the um, trauma, stored energy, stored survival stress, different words for it, that to me is the root issue of so many of these different things. If we can clear that, because it seems like that's what I've seen this in this uh, friend of mine with the antidepressants, you know, she came off it. And then of course, all that stuff that put her in, like was causing the anxiety and the panic attacks in the first place <clears throat> was all still there. And she's been dealing with it over the last few years after not being um, on the antidepressants. Um, so, yeah, I think um, she probably learned some skills, some, some really good skills while really, I might say, her capacity to handle, say, a panic attack. Or really, it's just about to be able to feel the capacity to, to experience what she was experiencing probably increased um, while she was on antidepressants because so she, she was able to practice certain things. But to really get to the bottom of it, she had to come off it and work through it. And she's still, you know, like all of us, it's a long process. It, it seems like within, <clears throat> within plant medicine, one of the, I think, more and more something that's very much spoken about is, is this idea of integration. You have some sort of experience, often it can be a cathartic experience, there can be learning, there can be teaching, maybe from a more scientific way, uh, there's neuroplasticity, neurogenesis, new neuropathways are opened, there's, there's new possibilities that are formed, there's different ways of seeing things, different ways of looking at things, there's insight that's gained, uh, there's maybe feelings of more self-worth, of more internal power. And this idea of, of integration, then, then how do you, uh, 
begin to put these these teachings or these these learnings these these changes into practice and something i found is is that somatic therapy seems to be a very useful tool like many people who are working with plant medicines seem to to really gain something in a way that they're maybe not finding with other integrative techniques um, why do you think that somatic therapy works well in conjunction with, with plant medicine? Well, I mean, based on my experience, it's, um, it seems like they work very similarly. Like, at least for me, you know, I've seen this with a lot of people, like a big part of the plant medicine journey is learning to get out of the head, get out of all the stories, all the, even the stories about what I think I need, what healing I think I need, what I need to fix, like all that, all in all of a go and, and almost surrendering to the medicine and the wisdom of the plants. Um, and so having too many ideas about what it is, what it means, where it's going, in my experience, gets in the way both in ceremony and afterwards. And um, the somatic stuff, the nervous system stuff, is very much works the same way where, you know, but like say so usually with therapy, in my understanding of a lot of talk therapy, traditionally, you know, psychotherapy, it's like let's go talk about what happened in your childhood and if we can analyze it enough and figure it out and pull it apart, we'll, we'll get to the bottom of why you're so fucked up or something like that. And um, the somatic the nervous system way looks at it, like I said, it's about the, it's not about the event. It's not about what happened when we were however old. Even, you know, like the in utero thing I mentioned before, in utero stress, in utero trauma. Even if that's there, it doesn't really matter. Like it doesn't help to focus on that specifically. What we do is the same with the plants where it's focus on what's occurring right now, what's present right now, what's arising right now. Let's feel that. You know, sometimes we can do a bit of, you know, if we're working with like a specific um, trauma that someone has, you know, you could, you could um, get them to recall the event for a few minutes to stir up some of the energy that's in there. But at the end of the day, it's about being present here and now, feeling what's happening in the body, not having stories about it, not analyzing it, not trying to figure out exactly why something happened or why this person did or said that thing or why I responded in that way. It all comes back to the feeling. And if I can feel that and feel through that and that through that feeling release that, whatever the, the symptom is that's related to that often dissolves on its own, which is it's very similar to plants where it's not usually about thinking or verb, it's not a verbal process. It's a felt embodied experience process. And so that's why I think they're so aligned because they're so similar. So to me, if we talk about integration, like, you know, I did a diet in February here in the Valley. And um, to me, I guess integration, because I've been thinking about this recently, is um, it's often like almost like I go into ceremony and, and I would say, well, yeah, I still think. I'm not saying I never think. I'm not perfect. Um, but I will clear things out. I'll purge. I'll yawn. I'll do different things. To, to obviously moving energy out, up and out of the body. But afterwards, I find for me, especially since doing all this nervous system stuff, the integration process is usually a matter of just feeling what's happening in the body. Uh, it's almost like, I mean, I don't know maybe the best way to explain it. I don't know if I have the best understanding of it, but how it seems to me at this point in time is that in ceremony, as I clear all this stuff out, I create all this space in my psyche, in my body-mind system, right? I think about the body and the mind as... There's not a mind that has a body. I feel like they're so interconnected. It's hard to find the boundaries between both. So um, it creates all this space, making all this space in the, the human system. And then uh, with that space comes room for old things to move. So old traumas, we could say, tra or old energy, survival stress. So right now, and this could be, this is gonna be different for everyone. I think it could be just anything under the sun in terms of felt experience, emotions, um, just different stories that are coming up, old patterns of behavior, old habits. Um, for me at the moment, it's, it's um, very physical where, you know, I'll be lying in bed at night, I'll wake up at night in the morning, I'll sit down and I find it works great when I make space for it. But it's just, it's really just, like I said, I'll be, <laughs> like before, I'll sit on my couch each morning at the moment and I just feel the couch and I look around. 
And as I do that, the body starts to open up and I start to, it depends on the day, but like at the moment, there'll be all kinds of stuff, twitches going on in the face, lots of stuff in the stomach, um, lots of activation. I don't know if I, probably feels most like fear, but I tend to think about it less as fear or anxiety and now more as just sensation or activation. It takes the story out of it and then it's easy for me to focus on it. I'm not thinking about what it is or where it's from. Like just all over the whole body. Um, and so to me, it's, fair, it's almost the same thing as I do in ceremony. I'm just, ideally, I'm just lying there feeling, being open so things can move. Um, and so anyway, so that's a long way of saying that I think they work very well together because they work in, they approach the problem in very, very similar ways. Like they're very much aligned, you could say. Uh, whereas, I don't know, therapy or uh, breath work or a lot of the different things people do aren't, yeah, for me at least, they just haven't had that same sense of alignment. Do you have a sense of that balance? Because um, I think you brought up an important point, like often in plant medicine work, I think, for example, like in a lot of Western contexts, it, it's being done in this this kind of psychedelic assisted therapeutical model, which is very psychological based. And, and a lot of that emphasizes how in the West we, we tend to deal with problems uh, in a therapeutic sense, which is talking about them. Mm -hmm. And... And I think many people would attest that they benefited from, from that form of therapy. Um, but often, as you said, I mean, often you hear like maybe in a more like traditional or indigenous context, there's not a lot of talking about the experience because I think there's something, one, that's seen as sacred about it. And there's two seen as something that often the workings of the mind are just that, that it's mind and that the medicine, if you want to call it that, there's an intelligence there that's working and it's working beyond the mind. And to talk about it in a way is just in a way like feeding that mental activity. Um, so do you have a sense of, of, of what that balance is? I mean, do you think like the somatic theory is working more on that, 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 obviously that felt sense and getting away from the talking. I mean, do you think at the same time, the, the other end of that like serves a purpose, the, the, the talking aspect, the, the rational aspect, the mental aspect, um, you know, because it seems like both of these things have their, their medicine. I, I mean, even in the, the talking, for example, like uh, going back to those archetypal ways of looking at things, like that's often, the archetypal feminine, which is like talking and sharing and, and the emotional aspect. Then you have like the archetypal masculine, which is like the silent, the, the strength, the, the doing, the, the not talking, but the action. And, you know, it seems like often we fall in one of these camps and that, that both of the camps, they have their benefit and they, they have their, their harm. The, the benefit of the talking and the sharing is there can be a release, there can be compassion, there can be, a you know... Uh, uh, bringing insight to something light, the downside could maybe be something like gossip, where then it becomes like actually charged and, and vitriolic, and and on the other end there's the there's the holding, the strength, the, the not talking, and instead of talking like doing, taking action. The uh, the downside of that could be maybe there isn't something that's released. There's not something that's cathartically expressed. So, do you, do you have a sense of like where somatic therapy fits into into the balance of that? Do, I mean, do you think it can embody both of those or, or do you think it's 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 balancing something? I mean, from my personal experience, everyone's different, but I know for me, I mean, the somatic stuff, the nervous system stuff has been so, like, such a game changer. Well, like I said, everything else I tried was, was all right. And this was just so much better, similar in, in what it was trying to do, but so much more effective that it was like in a category of its own. Um, so there is that, and that came with the cognitive aspect, right? So the nervous system theory is a cognitive piece to understand, to talk about fight and flight. These are all concepts, um, you know, to understand how safety works and how they can trigger certain issues. And, and it's a very conceptual, cognitive-based, you know, understanding of how all this stuff works. And it's useful, absolutely, like I said. It's also, it's also dangerous, and I've seen this in my own life where, with the plants where 
because of my understanding of the nervous system, I then go and have a ceremony or a diet. This happened in um, August uh, last year. I was doing a diet here. And um, I had a dream one night. It was a very scary, the most scary dream, terrifying dream I've ever had. The most terrified I've been in my entire life. And uh, the next day, I spent the whole day thinking about what it meant. And I developed this whole understanding of what it was and what it was about and what needed to happen that night in ceremony. Blah, blah, blah. It was a big story. And I thought it was all correct. And then we got to ceremony that night. And I remember um, Felix is like, so you've all been thinking too much all day. You guys have all been thinking all day long. And I'm like, not me. I'm, I'm excited about this ceremony tonight. I'm <laughs> and I realized by the end of that ceremony that I had one, I'd spent the whole day thinking. I knew what was really going on. And a lot of it was informed by my understanding of the nervous system and the fight and flight response. And so the, and this has happened a few different times where I have developed, taken a perspective on what was happening with me. Instead of simply being open and trusting that the plants know and that uh, what I have learned over the last probably six months, year, is that all my ideas about what it means, what it is, what it needs, other than simply being present and available and ready to feel it, everything else gets in the way. So it's this delicate thing where like the somatic stuff comes with, you know, like cognitive aspects like this nervous system theory. Um, but it's also delicate. I don't know. It's not dangerous. Dangerous in a, in a you know, it's more tongue in cheek when I say dangerous. It's not actually dangerous, but it's tricky because I think it's easy to then start to then identify with that, this perspective and think this is the truth. When really I think about now more of like the theory, the techniques, the whole goal is to feel, to get better at feeling. Um, that to me is it, is feeling more, feeling more deeply, feeling more clearly. You know, it leads to feeling better, but it's not really about that. It's really just about feeling. And so to me, the somatic stuff, the nervous system stuff, its goal, in my opinion, and all of these different tools, like even talk therapy and I think they, they even from what I understand of talk therapy, it's that if we talk about something enough, eventually we'll get to the emotion, to the feeling. So really it's like everything is oriented, really the destination is feeling. And feeling in its raw root, there are no stories. There's only right now. Because what I think I might be feeling in five minutes or tomorrow, or what I think this feeling means, these are all stories. So, and I think, you, I guess you learn this with the plants because I'm certainly learning that that's what I feel like I'm learning at the moment with these plants is that there's room for techniques and theory and ideas about what all this is, fight and flight and survival, stress and trauma, and it's helpful. Um, but at the same time, the real, where the work is done in my experience is in feeling. And so when I look at all the different techniques that are out there, that people use to try and resolve things. The more, the closer they get to feeling uh, without condition, and the better they are at getting people to do that, the better they work. The less they do that, the more people stay in their head and their stories and all their ideas about what it is and what you know, all that stuff, the less things really work. Um, so it's a, yeah, I don't, guess the short answer is, there's definitely room for theory, but that, to me, the theory is just a way to learn how to feel. Other than that, it's not even, you know, it's almost like eventually you let it all go. All the ideas go. So would you say in a, like in a, a, a greater sense, the, the more one feels, the better off they are? E even, even feeling all the, the, you know, the inevitable ups and downs of life, the, the things that we might not necessarily want to feel, but that the more we feel, the, the, the more whole we are. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's what it seems to me is like, all the problems come when it's like, I'm not willing to feel something. You know, like, why do something that's unhealthy? Why yell at someone that you love? Unless it's to avoid feeling something. Like, that's I see, like I mentioned my dad, you know, like I, I see it's coming from maybe these people in Thailand, it's like, it's people who aren't able to feel something that's how I see so much maybe most if all problems um, are because of that people are not willing to feel something and if they were willing to feel all of it everything every little bit I think we were we would solve so many problems in the world so 
Well, John, this has been great. We're uh, we're actually coming up on your uh, your leaving time. Mm-hmm. We're we're uh, two and a half hours. So, uh, anything else we we didn't touch on? You do you like to share? We we still have a few minutes. Mm. I mean, I like I love this stuff. I really fucking totally love it. Like this way of learning to feel, learning to be, not just feel, because meditation can teach people science to feel like mindfulness, but to be in the body, um, to be embodied. Like these are all just words and ideas. That's what we're talking about. That's talking. But that to me, even with psychedelics, like that's what, you know, I'd had huge, you know, things happen with psychedelics, you know, like, you know, when you're old, everything just falls away and it's bliss and it's like heaven, you know, basically. I've had different things like that happen with plants in different ways. And I'm not saying I'm in that right now, but I always would come out of that and come back to life and like, well, I'm just still just me. Like it just doesn't last. It doesn't stick around. And I, I meditate and I do all these, all the things that we've talked about to try and get it to click in and it just wouldn't, something wasn't working. And it was, this getting into the body everything we've talked about feeling getting into the body learning how not to think so much how to see through all the stories and learning how to really feel that's what's um you know unlocked so much of the we might say embodied like the more embodied i am in my body the more i can start to embody all the stuff that comes from the plants maybe not like you know this really intense bliss you know i'm not in that that's only happened on the plants but but just the the lessons and the teachings, the more I'm here, the more I feel, the more it all seems to like land. I don't know how well, why it works like that, but the more I think, the more I block the process. Um, so if people want to, I know you talk a lot about psychedelics, if people want to you know, bring more of the, the goodness in from the plants, to me it's all about feeling, all about getting into the body. Great. If people resonate with, with what you said and, and they want to reach out or connect more or learn more, is there a way they can contact you or resources? Yeah. Uh, At the moment, there is. Uh, I don't do social media. I really find social media difficult these days. Um, but if people want to learn more about me and uh, what I do and how I work with people, they can go to rageheart.co. So it's like Braveheart, but instead of brave, rage, heart. Dot co. Or I think you can just type in, um, I'm pretty sure it's, it'll show up in Google if you just type in Rage Heart in Google. And um, yeah, the best place to start is I do a daily email newsletter. I call it the Daily Rage, where I, uh, I share stories and tips and ideas and ways to, yeah, just ways to use all this stuff and, and try to help people learn. I mean, really my goal is to, to, this has helped me so much. Like it's changed everything. I've done it for other people I know and it's, I just want to, share it with as many people as I can. So, yeah, the best place is rageart.co and the um, sign up to the email list would be the best place to start. Great, man. Well, thank you so much for your time. This was great. I, I didn't know, you know, super what to expect, but, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you, you share beautifully and, and I think you have a, an important message. And, uh, you know, even just from my experience, I've seen this kind of somatic work really, really help people. Mm-hmm. Uh, just in life, but but especially in in conjunction with plant medicine, it seems to be one of the things that really uh, allows people to connect uh, in a in a deeper way. Like especially if the plants weren't maybe able to do the the job completely, it seems like a really nice mm-hmm. balance to it. So. Yeah, man, I, I wish you all the best, and mm-hmm. I hope some people reach out to you and. Uh, and I'll see you uh, Sunday on the mats. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, dude. Yeah, dude. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah. 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 All right, everyone. That's it. I hope you enjoyed this show. Uh, it was a pleasure for me to sit down. Uh, I felt like I, I also learned a lot. And um, I think it's a really important topic, uh, this idea of somatic therapy. So 
I hope you all learned something. I hope you enjoyed this episode. As always, if you're able to help to support this work, uh, it's deeply appreciated. Patreon is a really good way. It's a website you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. There's different tiers you can sign up for. Uh, and also those tiers give you different things back, which is also one of the um, the, the things I like about um, websites like Patreon is they, they very much work on this idea of reciprocity. So if you feel like you're gaining something from this podcast, that's a, a really way to kind of express that reciprocity and give back um, to all of the the patrons who are supporting that way. Thank you very much. Um, as always, I, I deeply appreciate your support. Uh, there's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. If you're not in a position to do that, uh, helping with the algorithms is a really uh, big help. So if you're listening to this on YouTube, hitting the subscribe button, turning on the notification bell, liking the video. Um, and then if you're listening to this, uh, whatever the platform is, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the big ones subscribing or following the show and then with apple Podcasts, leaving a star rating and a short review is a really big help so i think that's it um i'm shooting a number of these podcasts before i begin to travel i'll be going to portugal and ireland soon uh so um uh I've shot a number of these in advance. Um, I, I can't think of the exact order of how these are coming out, so I'm not sure who will be the following guests after this. Um, but as always, I hope to bring on some uh, some really fascinating and interesting people, people who I find uh, have a, um, an important voice um, that they can be shared. So I think that's it. Uh, I hope this finds you all well. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I, uh, I hope everyone is, is, is doing well and happy. Uh, thank you for all the support. And I will see you all on the next episode. Don't I